Alan Wake is one of my favorite first time playthroughs ever. Before I ever played it though, I wasn't sure if the next big thing from Remedy was going to be my cup of tea as it seemed a lot slower paced than Max Payne, which I'd adored. So I borrowed Alan Wake from a friend for the weekend while I house sat and decided to give it a try. I must have played it for nearly every waking hour I wasn't working or sleeping through that day and a half. And let me tell you, that was the best day and a half I spent doing anything in 2010. Calm down. I was rooted to the screen, totally immersed in the mystery and the atmosphere. And when it was all over, I knew I'd found one of my all-time favorite experiences. And judging by the two DLC episodes it got and the American Nightmare game that released in 2012, it seemed Alan Wake was at the forefront of Remedy's mind and would be fast-tracked to get a full-fledged sequel soon. But years passed, and the trail eventually ran cold on a sequel, and we didn't even have a hint of whether Alan Wake 2 was enough of a thing to even be stuck in development hell like Alan was in the dark place. Had I found yet another great franchise like Condemned or Half-Life that would just go silent right as it was getting really good? Oh no! See, the rights to Alan Wake remained with Microsoft, and as of 2016, Remedy had seemingly moved on from the franchise, going on to make a new IP in Quantum Break. But as word spread of yet another new IP in Control, so too did the news, mid-development, that the publishing rights for Alan Wake had reverted back to Remedy. And then, a whole nine years after Alan Wake's release, 2019's Control burst onto the scene with thrilling aplomb, becoming my second favorite game that year behind the other game about a redhead saving her little brother with superpowers in Plague Tale Innocence. On its face, Control was a discreet title, starring a brand new protagonist in Jesse Faden, introducing the Federal Bureau of Control and its many members, and new enemies seemingly of a totally different variety than the Taken in Alan Wake. But ever so slowly, Alan began to seep into the game till it became clear that this was more than an easter egg with the start of Alan Wake's full-fledged return. The announcement of Alan Wake 2 at the 2021 Game Rewards sent ripples down my spine. I could not believe that this title was finally being made. My first instinct, of course, was to rush back to the beginning of his saga and play Alan Wake, its two DLC episodes, the American Nightmare expansion, if that's the right word, and then Control, all in sequence to prepare myself. But as I powered through these games, I found a lot of quirks my nostalgia had glossed over, and perhaps most importantly, a lot of unanswered questions I hadn't even realized were being asked in the game's story. And in the wake of Alan Wake 2's trailer showing us that Max Payne and Martin Hatch were being brought into the Remedy Connected universe as spiritual successors Alex Casey and Mr. Door, it's clear that there are even more connections than I had imagined that I needed to bone up on in order to appreciate where the second game was going to take us. So the purpose of today's video is certainly nostalgia for one of my favorite video games ever, but it's also to compile all the Alan Wake knowledge I could find so that you and I can figure out just how much we don't know and know as much as we possibly we can, never want to, in time for Alan Wake 2. That means we'll go over everything I could find across all media about Alan's story, and the lore of the Remedy Connected universe, and, of course, also how these games play, how hard they were to develop, and how well they've aged. I'll even throw in some introspective shit about what I related to and Alan's creative struggles, and what the price of great art can be. But before we go any further, I almost think it goes without saying, but there will be massive spoilers for everything Alan Wake's ever been in, from the first First game to the two DLCs, American Nightmare, the This House of Dreams blog, the additional comic books, and Control. And really quickly, before we get into the heart of darkness, if you've been enjoying the channel or this video ends up really doing it for you, please consider supporting the work. You can become a YouTube channel member, and you can become a patron at Patreon forward slash High Functioning Medium. And if you're looking for ways to support the channel that don't cost you anything extra, feel free to use my GOG and NordVPN affiliate links that sends me a little chunk of the sale at no extra cost to you. Just know that any and all support is invaluable, even if it's simply watching and engaging with the videos themselves. So thank you in advance, and I hope you enjoy the show. So with that out of the way, as Dr. Hartman asked in his book, The Creator's Dilemma, now let's begin, shall we? Aristotle once famously said that there is no great genius without a touch of madness. Alan Wake's own life reflects this, as despite his great success as a crime writer, he's often not sure what to do with the insecurity fame has brought him, so he distracts himself by getting drunk, starting fights, and abusing his wife's readiness to help him, taking her for granted. Being an artist is hard enough when you're good, and just because you're good doesn't mean you don't have to engage in the struggle every time you make something to stay at that level. Take Remedy Entertainment, for example. Though Alan Wake and their first big hit, Max Payne, may seem to have a lot in common, what with them both being 
and stylish, story-driven third-person shooters, Alan Wake was a whole new ball game to remedy when they first started out. The pressure after Max Payne's success was still very real, and it was over a year before Remedy really felt like they were settling in on their next project, which would become Alan Wake. Now, make no mistake, fans' anticipation for this game was palpable, but also growing a little anxious, and it's easy to see why. Max Payne had come out in October 2003, and it wasn't until May 14, 2010 that Alan Wake hit shelves, almost a full seven years later. Even for modern game development times, this was a pretty long process. Lead writer Sam Lake knew that he wanted something deeper than Max Payne, and he took specific inspiration from the works of Stephen King and David Lynch's Twin Peaks, two horror mainstays that often show the dark underbelly of idyllic places and people. Alan Wake certainly inherits the tonality of these works and artists, but it's also deeply indebted to the trends of its era and Sam Lake's love of cinema. Sam Lake took screenwriting classes late in his academic career studying English literature at the University of Helsinki, and he even wrote some screenplays during that time. One, loosely translated as Undertow, was a particular inspiration for Alan Wake, featuring Tor and Odin Anderson, a witch-like character based on the Baba Yaga, and a mystical light switch called the Clicker, all of which make their way into Alan Wake in almost identical forms. Now, judging by how Lake liked to incorporate cinema into Remedy's games like Quantum Break's companion piece TV show and Control's live-action scenes or the fictional TV shows inside of Max Payne, Alan Wake was pretty much destined to exhibit some type of cinematic characteristic, which in this case was the episodic structure of a TV show where each episode ended in a cliffhanger. The TV show Lost was cited as a specific influence, as the way in which one consumed the DVD box sets of it and shows like it seemed to remedy the best way to pace longer content like a video game. This design choice was also likely in keeping with the rise of episodic content and, you know, binge-watching shows that Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime encouraged in the late aughts. Gaming soon followed suit with games like 2008's Alone in the Dark, which divided itself up into episodes with previously on segments and DVD menu-like controls for skipping around to different scenes in the game, like you were using scene selection or fast forward. And if you'd like to hear my full thoughts on this ambitious game, go ahead and check out that Alone in the Dark retrospective video that should be up on your screen right now. Now, Alone in the Dark wasn't alone <laughs> in trying episodic gimmicks as Telltale Games started to hit their stride with Back to the Future and Jurassic Park before they really hit it big with my favorite story of 2012 in The Walking Dead Season 1. Now, I won't pretend this makes Alan Wake any better per se, this episodic structure, but it does fit with the game's intention to be a suspenseful thriller above all else. And I think that's one of the reasons I simply couldn't put it down for a day and a half straight. Now, as for that gripping story, it took a while to get this good and it would wind up being inspired by how hard the gameplay was to perfect. Alan Wake begins with Alan suffering from writer's block after he's put down his long-running Alex Casey series by killing off the titular character in a book called The Sudden Stop, a meta-reference to Remedy ending their run with Max Payne in Max Payne 2, The Fall of Max Payne. You know, that saying, it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop, that kind of thing. But like Wake, Remedy would struggle to find their footing outside of their comfort zone as they tried to develop their first new IP since making the Max Payne games. At first, the team wanted to branch out in terms of level design and make Alan Wake a free-roam open-world game. Several Remedy members, including the art director Saku Lettinen and lead game designer Lassie Sepinen, got 40,000 photographs from North Bend near Seattle, where Twin Peaks was shot, and also Astoria, where the Ring movie was shot. They went to Crater Lake in Oregon, which was the inspiration for Cauldron Lake, the Crater Lake name possibly even inspiring the volcano in the story, but <laughs> that's just an educated guess. The team took some extremely literal inspiration from these areas, as you can see, and just started mapping out the world piece by piece with some of their own in-house tech that could populate areas quickly and precisely. As usual, Remedy astounds with how much they do from scratch, both in terms of story originality and technology. Now, this incredible technical world was built to accommodate gameplay that emphasized the classic good versus evil, light versus dark dynamic very literally, which was inspired by Finland's extremely long nights of winter, where the sun sometimes only comes up for several hours, and vice versa in the summer. Initially, the daytime segments of the game would be very normal and set in the quote-unquote real world, and you'd spend your time gathering resources like gas for generators and hooking up lights, so that when night fell, you were prepared to hold out and stand your ground against the forces of darkness. The volcano in Bright Falls would be erupting because of the dark presence's activity, so the area would be evacuated and totally devoid of friendly NPCs, a choice I'm very glad they chose not to go with, as the supporting cast is essential to Alan Wake staying interesting. Remedy would even consider tornadoes and tentacle creatures that spawn taken into the game. 
But eventually the feature creep of this ambitious open world concept proved more and more unwieldy until the team realized they needed to go back to the drawing board. When Remedy showed off the game to publishers in 2005, they had more of a tech demo to show off than anything else, as the only thing about the gameplay was basically a five second teaser at the end of the demo where Alan was approaching a lighthouse and being chased by Taken. Microsoft even tried to step in and help, but Sam Lake said that this was a case of too many cooks in the kitchen, despite everyone's best intentions. So, Remedy created the Sauna Group, a dedicated task force of leads and other bigwigs at Remedy that made it their mission to fight against the heat and pressure of the dev cycle, like a sauna, in order to nail down individual conceptual workloads and get them functional enough to start being used with the rest of the game's moving parts. Walls were covered in tacked up papers and other items like they were hunting a serial killer as the team worked through their various tasks. And while Lake has famously said that Alan Wake's struggle with writer's block is not autobiographical, he does note that it was placed into the story to represent the creative blockage that Remedy experienced as they tried to figure out what Alan Wake was and what form of it did the concept justice. Finally, the game seemed to ironically work best when Remedy went away from their initial vision and could pack the game down behind a strong, guiding narrative that traversed select areas of their open-world environments in a linear fashion, much like Max Payne. Also like the Hardened Detective's popular series, Alan Wake would be an action game. So, once Remedy returned to their roots, things started picking up and the game started finally taking shape and emerging from the darkness of development hell. In the end, Alan Wake would understandably become the project that Sam Lake was the most proud of. I guess you could say he was pretty relieved when it was finished. Finished. <laughs> so, that's the history of how it all came to be. But what did the homies at Remedy actually make? So, let's just get stuck in and relive all of Alan Wake, and I'll provide observations and theory crafting as we go. What I won't do is a boilerplate transliteration of every event in game nor are we going to start and end where the game proper does. I want this to be a resource to you to get the full perspective of everything Remedy has released in connection with Alan Wake, so we're actually going to start our story analysis with the history of Bright Falls, as seen in the Alan Wake files, and then see the town from the perspective of two men who suffer very similarly to Alan Wake. Their stories provide a lot of insight and contrast to what our hero goes through in the main game. So, Bright Falls. While the town of Bright Falls would appear to be an idyllic Twin Peaks analog where everyone knows everybody and everything's honest, hardworking, and hunky-dory, it is also a Twin Peaks analog, meaning that it's all that and it's home to some very weird shit that lurks just beneath the surface. Dating as far back as the 1850s, Bright Falls, Washington started out as a community of native tribes and white American fur trappers high up in the mountains. Since that time, sightings of creatures like the Sasquatch, Quetzalcoatl, and a Brontosaurus, some have called their Loch Ness Monster, have been seen near Cauldron Lake. But even local tribes scoffed at these reported sightings, as few if any of these creatures are even part of local belief systems anyway, not to mention the improbability of their existence otherwise. But what's important to note is exactly that there is a curious diversity of cultures these creatures originate from, and that many reports describe these creatures as being covered in darkness so deep they stand out even in pitch black nighttime. Now this reminds me a lot of Carl Jung's Collective Unconscious, which Control made canon in the Remedy Connected universe. This concept posits that all of humanity across cultures and times inherit instinctual proclivities and attractions towards baseline symbols and archetypes like the wise old man, the great mother, the tree of life, or even things like flood myths. We'll also see later that sometimes the dark place can manifest things by itself based on enough belief being poured into that idea. Now, not all sightings at the lake were this mythical, however, but they're no less puzzling. Shadowy dogs, people, and even an oily black bird species described as ravenous and nocturnal have been seen for years. Other unexplainable phenomena, like a couple who died at the same time across town and emitted inky blackness as they passed, and who were also rumored to have made some deal with the devil. In another case, a musician went missing for an entire winter and showed up in perfect health only to disappear in the spring, a season that was soon racked with a suspicious amount of tornadoes, dense fog, and howling noises. In 1970, tragedy struck a couple that lived in a cabin called Diver's Isle in the middle of Cauldron Lake. Barbara Jagger died mysteriously in the lake despite being an avid swimmer, and her boyfriend Thomas Zane, a well-known poet and amateur diver, disappeared soon thereafter. Coincidentally enough, shortly after Zane's disappearance, the volcano above Cauldron Lake erupted, and all trace of the couple's former lives were destroyed as their cabin sunk beneath the waves. Later, strange lights could be seen over Cauldron Lake, and a host of glowing messages were found throughout Bright Falls, often accompanied by a torch symbol. 
What these events mean is too perplexing to comprehend, and yet too arresting to ignore. The first personal look we get behind this dark curtain is found in Bright Falls, a 30-minute live-action prequel to Alan Wake that released the day before the game did. It feels very much like Twin Peaks, with melodramatic characters, spontaneous and strange events like diner workers bringing somebody they never met a birthday cake out of the blue, and tons of subliminal and confusing imagery. The film opens with a mysterious diver emerging from black waters with a body bag that he lays down on the shore before rowing back onto the lake. Was this Thomas Zane or someone else entirely? We'll find out soon enough. The prequel stars Jake Fisher, a self-medicating reporter running from his marital problems by going to Bright Falls to interview the famous pop psychologist Dr. Emil Hartman. Hartman runs a mental health center for artists called the Cauldron Lake Lodge, and he just came out with a self-help book called The Creator's Dilemma. On Jake's drive into Bright Falls, he's distracted by a phone call from his wife and ends up hitting a deer, which screams in pain when he shines his flashlight on it. The next morning, he reunites briefly with an old flame named Ellen, whom the Alan Wake Signal DLC confirms is the biographer of famous eccentric Cynthia Weaver, whom we'll meet later. Jake then heads to his interview with Dr. Hartman, who curiously requests that Jake not film the interview but handwrite his notes. As he's writing, Jake experiences shocking visions, including a flare being lit and a severed deer head sinking into dark water. When he comes to, the interview's somehow over, and Jake's shaking the hand of a curiously smiling Hartman as if nothing happened. As Jake drives away perplexed, he glances over at his notes, which include a severed deer head drawing and manic scribblings like, No more light. Embrace me or fear me, and I have already ensured my legacy. He knows is perhaps the most chilling, as it implies the suspicious Dr. Hartman knows something about Jake. While looking at the deer head drawing, Jake sees a man walking along the side of the road with a deer head in hand. A premonition, perhaps? What's happening to Jake, and what does Hartman seem to know about it? What we find out later is that Jake was actually the person in the body bag, having been dragged out of what is likely Cauldron Lake, hence why he keeps having blackouts and weird visions and waking up in strange places like this. How Hartman got a hold of Jake, or when, is never really clear, but in light of the main game's narrative, I think it's safe to say that Hartman kidnapped him and wanted to see what a creative person like Jake would do if exposed to the dark presence below Cauldron Lake which we know from the main game takes the thoughts of artists and brings them to life. An interesting connection between Bright Falls and the main game is that the diver and the guy behind Jake when he's trying to buy drugs are both played by the same actor Joseph A. Smith, who's credited as Mott in Bright Falls. Alan Wake fans will recognize Mott as the kidnapper from the main game, which means Hartman and Mott have been targeting creatives before Alan, trying to see what Cauldron Lake will do with and to them indicating that Jake's being followed and watched by Hartman wherever he goes. Later on in the prequel, Hartman even messes with Jake further when Jake has to go back to him to get his copy of the creator's dilemma signed, and he confesses to Hartman that he's been having blackouts and that he killed a deer with his car. Hartman seems unimpressed and asks if there's anything more he'd like to tell him, as if hoping for elucidation. He then checks Jake's pulse and looks at Jake's pupils with a flashlight, which Jake has a bad reaction to, being unable to withstand it and having to run away, leaving behind a smiling Hartman. Jake then duct takes himself to his refrigerator in the hotel room he's staying in and turns on his camera, but wakes up the next morning to find that he's trashed the building in a psychotic rage. And though a sheriff's deputy named Mulligan shows up, he writes it off as a likely wild animal attack, like maybe a wild buck. (laughs) Oh dear. Jake meets up with Ellen again, who gets off the phone upon seeing him arrive, and we hear the person on the other end of the line say he has no idea. Jake tells Ellen he doesn't trust himself and asks her to drive him away from here, and she does, the scene cutting to a version where Jake's driving, but we can see Ellen's bloodied high heels in the floorboard of the passenger side. Jake! This doesn't look good. He comes to a stop, and a time lapse shows that he's left the vehicle. Soon, we see police lights and the flare we saw in earlier visions. And then we see a man and a woman ask a police officer what's going on here. Just an accident, he says, and the man and the woman whom we will come to know as Alan Wake and Alice drive away as the scene cuts to black. 
And that's the sordid tale of Jake Fisher, Alan Wake's dark prototype, a writer of a similar physical description who's experiencing psychological and marital problems, and who's afflicted by whatever evil lurks in the depths of Cauldron Lake. Is this the fate of all artists and craftsmen who enter Bright Falls? Well, just ask Clay Stewart, the author of The Alan Wake Files, who brings a lot more light to bear on just what's going on here. At first blush, Clay Stewart's name may not ring a bell, but he's actually the guy in Alan Wake's dream intro who says, Wake does not, and Clay is murdered in shocking fashion by an axe-wielding shadow man. But this is not the end of Clay's story, nor is it the beginning. Clay Stewart is an everyman from Madison, Wisconsin. When his life is turned upside down by the recurring dreams he starts having about the man he will come to know as Alan Wake. The most involved version of the dream is that he's pursued by a loud storm and shadowy figures all the way to a lighthouse. There, he and Alan Wake often end up saving each other, but no matter what, Clay always ends up dying eventually. Clay keeps a dream diary detailing every trip to what feels like an underwater world populated by unknowable dark forces whose only desire was to destroy me. Clay freaks out all the more when he falls asleep while the Night Springs TV show is on, and he's jarred awake by Alan Wake's voice as he's interviewed about his book The Sudden Stop, in which hardened detective Alex Casey dies. Clay writes Alan with no reply, but remains obsessed with finding out why he and Alan seem to have this connection. He soon becomes so wrapped up in his quest for answers that he and his wife's relationship strains to the point where they don't speak anymore. But while his relationships are breaking down, Clay's obsessive search finally pays off once he finds out that the lighthouse is in Bright Falls. He takes a bus down there and finds it's as bad as he feared. People speak in hushed tones about a creepy woman in mourning clothes appearing around town, there are freak storms, and horrible accidents. People say little and seem almost held hostage to not say more. Clay eventually checks into room number two at the Majestic Motel and finds a green cardboard box under the bed with documents belonging to the room's previous occupant. FBI agent Robert Nightingale. Clay can't believe it, but Nightingale seems to be on Alan's trail too and is now desperate to stop him. Clay learns that Alan Wake is here and that his wife Alice just disappeared, so armed with the comfort that he's not crazy after all, Clay sets out to search for the truth himself. Now it's not the end of Clay's story, but we'll save that for after we're through with Alan's story. So let's get stuck into Alan Wake, the main attraction, and one of my favorite video games ever, and one which I realize how much I don't understand about, which both exhilarates and gives me a nasty case of brain worms. Now this will be more of a guided tour where we'll attempt to keep the drama of the story intact, but also pause as we go to critique and admire as necessary. Please note, too, that I'm using the Xbox 360 version footage for this video because that's the version I fell in love with and because it holds up pretty well. While the remastered version has much better facial animations for characters like Alice, it does the Silent Hill HD collection thing where it cleans up the atmospheric effects so much they don't really look scary anymore, and the remastered version makes Alan's likeness Il Cavilli look like a chinless seagull, and I can't have them massacring my boy like that. Look how they massacred my boy. So, the original it is, and this footage is on the Nightmare difficulty, which I somehow never played before. So, as Dr. Hartman has previously been noted to say, now let's begin, shall we? Let's begin our walkthrough of Alan Wake, or our wake through, with the beautiful, almost Bioshockian opening strings, which kick on before Matthew Peretta's excellent opening monologue. In a horror story, the victim keeps asking why, but there can be no explanation, and there shouldn't be one. The unanswered mystery is what stays with us the longest and it's what we'll remember in the end. I absolutely love the intonation of Peretta's delivery. It sounds like someone reading a story kind of under their breath. So it feels low key, yet mysterious. If there's anything that will feel like home in Alan Wake 2, it'll be this guy's voice. Now, as for those strings I mentioned, composer Petriolanco normally uses samples in his work, but loved using a live orchestra this time around, and I think it adds a lot of class and romanticism to a story that can be a little pulpy and overwritten at times. You'll be hearing quite a bit of the soundtrack's goodness for yourself throughout this video, so I won't go into it too crazy in depth, but if you'd like to hear a little bit more, you can find the Alan Wake section in my Horror Game soundtracks video if you so choose. For now, let's focus on that writing that's sometimes a little cornball, which may be a feature, maybe a bug. Stephen King once wrote that nightmares exist outside of logic and there's little fun to be had in explanations they're antithetical to the poetry of fear in a horror story the victim keeps asking why but there can be no explanation and there shouldn't be one the unanswered mystery is what stays with us the longest and it's what we'll remember in the end my name is alan wake i'm a writer
Alan Wake introduces himself with narration, which feels appropriate considering he's a writer. I'm a writer. Yeah, okay, dog. I, I, I just said that. <laughs> this guy. I never paid much mind to this opening paragraph because it seems so showy and on the nose, name-dropping some esoteric Stephen King quote that seems to give the game a pre-made out for when it's not making much sense. It's a mystery, bro. I can't tell you. I'm a man of mystery. But, cool story, Remedy actually got King's permission to use this quotation and even sent him copies of the game as a thank you, which he unfortunately couldn't play due to his lack of an Xbox. But as for the quotation's meaning, I'll admit, I've definitely played along with this idea before, having researched Signalis for months on end for an upcoming video, or when I used to stay up late getting actual spine chills while reading Twin Peaks The Return Theories on Reddit. But unlike those more labyrinthine experiences, Alan Wake's tight pace and easy-to-relate-to concepts of dark versus light are so easily compelling by themselves that it's easy to overlook when the game is messing with you or raising questions that need to be answered. And as we go on, I'll make sure to draw your attention to them to hopefully enrich your understanding of the world as we veer towards the convergence of so many years of Remedy games in Alan Wake 2. Okay, so first mystery first, episode 1, Nightmare, specifically, Alan's. In this nightmare, Alan instinctually knows that he's late for something and is trying to reach a lighthouse when he inadvertently hits a hitchhiker. More like a hit hiker. <laughs> this hitchhiker hit is not unlike Jake Fisher from the Bright Falls prequel when he hits a deer while driving on a back road. And, like Jake's situation, the thing that's hit with the car disappears into thin air. Once the hitchhiker disappears, Alan takes off into the forest towards the lighthouse. He's soon pursued by a shadowy version of the hitchhiker who seems to remember Wake from somewhere and accuses him of playing God with people's lives, making them up and then killing them off. Even identifying himself as a creation of Alan that should be proof enough that he's a hack, no pun intended. Alan has a moment of clarity, realizing this hitchhiker is a character from a story he's been working on. The hitchhiker jeers at Alan, asking him how it feels to die at the hands of his own creation, which I think is a very important aspect of what Alan Wake has to say about the dangers of the creative process on the artist. We romanticize the tortured artist so much and always assume it's worth all the suffering and anguish to make something future generations will always remember you for, but at what cost? Now keep this in mind as we go because it started to speak to me unexpectedly, as I always thought that Alan Wake was too on the nose and mechanical about the way it treated writers and other artists. But like Alan, we've got something a little more pressing to think about, a growing storm that threatens to sweep Alan up, so he runs into a nearby cabin and right past the aforementioned Clay Stewart who seems to know Alan. Clay is murdered by the hitchhiker in shocking fashion right before Alan's eyes. Alan, now trapped in this cabin, sees an eye that would appear to be his on a nearby TV screen, and sees a curious poster of a man in an old-school diver's suit with the name Tom the Poet above it. But Alan has no time to dawdle as the storm starts to shake the cabin until the back door is vaporized, and a floating light appears and tells him to follow the light. The voice in the light then recites a strange poem, as if he thinks it will help. It goes like this. For he did not know that beyond the lake he called home lies a deeper, darker ocean green, where waves are both wilder and more serene. To its ports I've been. To its ports I've been. Do you understand? No. Follow my light. The voice continues that it has come here to warn Alan that the shadowy force oppressing the nightmare is called the Dark Presence, and it's sleeping now, but when it feels Alan coming, it will wake up. The voice states that the only way to defeat the Dark Presence is to use light, and so Alan retrieves a nearby flashlight and burns away the darkness from the hitchhiker with it, making him vulnerable to a flurry of gunfire, kind of like how the Halo series' shield system works. Alan's cool wrinkle on this mechanic is that your flashlight runs out of charge the longer you aim it, but you can boost the beam's effectiveness by reloading batteries at will so that the beam of light remains uninterrupted. The catch is that your charge naturally recharges very slowly, so you have to balance this ability with the need to often expend tons of batteries to keep the offensive up. It's a clever mechanic that makes perfect game sense, even if that's definitely not how batteries work or flashlights work in real life, and Energizer probably didn't appreciate their product placement reflecting so poorly on their product's quality. But with that combat lesson out of the way, the bright presence leaves the dream, and Alan soon acquires a flare gun that explodes the shadow men called Taken like a murdery fireworks display. Oh, and spoilers, blowing up Taken with flares or flashbangs later on never gets old, so we have that to look forward to. Alan stylishly fights his way across a bridge as he's pursued by a violent storm. He takes refuge in the lighthouse, but something comes for him from the top, whispering, Is he here? Alan, wake up. <gasps> Shh, 
baby. Just another nightmare. Everything's fine. Turns out that voice was right. Alan and Alice are on a ferry coming into Bright Falls, and they are indeed here. Alice seems like a sweet lady and a great wife. My ears definitely pricked up at the name Alice, as I feel like that's awfully connotative of Alice in Wonderland, and we are very much definitely about to go down a rabbit hole of sorts very soon. Alice's only real downside is how plasticky her facial animations are, though of course that's no fault of her own. She's also a photographer, and she asks Alan to pose for some photos with the beautiful landscape in the background as they wait for the ferry to land. They trade some loving marital banter, and eventually Alan even makes friends with Pat Main, a local radio DJ. As charming as this scene is, I do have to critique Remini's in-game dialogue mix. It's really brassy, like they're in a bathroom. All pre-rendered cutscene dialogue is well-balanced and of studio quality, but for whatever reason, anything meant to be naturalistic and outdoors has this weird, built-in echoey quality to it. I won't pretend I don't recognize a famous writer such as yourself, Mr. Wake. You know he's going to be calling you every five minutes. Barry is Barry. I can always turn off the phone. What did I tell you? But anyway, nitpicks aside, one thing we will likely miss on a first playthrough is that even in this serene moment, danger lurks. Notice this gentleman in the cap who looks just like the guy who followed Jake Fisher, whom we suspect has a connection to Dr. Hartman and is likely the same man as the diver who dunked Jake into Cauldron Lake. Time will tell, of course. Alan then gets a call from his goofy, somewhat obnoxious Agent Barry, who seems a little too invested in the idea that this vacation to Bright Falls get Alan's creative juices flowing again. Alan blows him off, saying they're just getting settled in. Once they arrive at the shore, Alice goes to get gas and drops off Alan at the Oh Dear Diner so he can meet Mr. Carl Stuckey, who has the key to the cabin where they'll be staying. As soon as Alan enters the diner, he finds a standee of himself advertising his most recent book, The Sudden Stop. The waitress Rose recognizes him instantly and starts gushing over him. I'm looking for... Mr. Wake. Alan, wake. Oh, God. I am your biggest fan. I know people say that all the time, but I really am. I'm glad to hear that. Ugh, adoring fans, am I right? Golly, you're the best. I'm going to follow you and watch you and worship the ground you walk on. Let's go. She informs Alan that Carl's in the bathroom, so he'll have to wait to get his key. And while he waits, a friendly cop named Rusty recommends the coffee Dale Cooper style, but talks over Alan's internal monologue, funnily enough. Uh, right. Try the coffee. So much for Just don't blame me when you fall in love, because it'll break your heart when you have to leave. And then these two elderly brothers interrupt you too if you walk in their direction too soon. They even interrupt themselves sometimes. Just because we're brothers, don't think I won't murder it you does in that. your sleep. Get stuck. Yeah. You need to give it a good solid whack! This section is an especially bad example, but trigger dialogue interrupting narration or internal monologues is a frequently distracting occurrence in Alan Wake that robs the game of some immersion and keeps from building suspense in certain cases too. But soon Alan runs into a curious old lady hovering near the back of the diner, who's holding a lamp much like the log lady holds her log in Twin Peaks, a comparison that will prove more and more apt in a couple chapters. She warns Alan not to go back there, but Alan's impatient and wants to get the key faster, so he goes back to the men's room, which curiously has no lights turned on. An old lady in funeral garb pops up out of seemingly nowhere, saying Carl's taken ill and has tasked her with giving Alan the key and directions to the cabin, which is on the very inspiring cauldron lake, which she's sure Alan will enjoy. Slightly unsettled by her forwardness and, you know, the pitch black darkness, Alan takes the key and leaves the back room, only to be stopped by the loopy old brothers again who say, Splendid, splendid, it's been a long time, Tom. Good to see you. Hey, you wouldn't have to have a bottle of whiskey, Tom. I wish. Okay, whatever that means. The friendly cop, Rusty, says that the elderly brothers are called the Andersons, and they're actually waiting on Dr. Hartman to retrieve them as they have wandered off again from his clinic at Cauldron Lake Lodge. Man, what is he up to with these old codgers? Are the two brothers out of their minds calling Alan Tom, or is something else going on? Hmm. Hmm. Technically, first-time players may miss this, but the game actually told us already who Tom could be, albeit without many specifics. Remember that poster of Tom the Poet inside the cabin while Alan was just dreaming? Now the fact that Alan doesn't comment on this little clue that he could very possibly remember is a remedy trick they use throughout the game. They rarely announce the most complex ideas with any fanfare, so it's up to the player to catch things like this. And while it's not essential to enjoying remedy games, knowing these small connections that keep adding up is a fascinating minigame that gives you a look behind the curtain to where you're not just receiving information, but actively participating in understanding it and making predictions based on these metaphysical rules, which is really what we'll be building to this whole video. 
So with all that in mind, Alan and Alice meet back up and drive away towards the cabin at Cauldron Lake. As they depart, however, a visibly affected Carl Stuckey storms out of the diner after them, saying they forgot their keys. Well, that's not a good sign. On the road, Alice brings up how inspirational this place will be for Alan, but he brushes her off, too, not wanting to think about work. He's had writer's block since he released The Sudden Stop two years earlier, not being able to write a word. So, to the countryside the two have gone, in hopes that Alan can rejuvenate his spirit. And oh, what a place to try it in. It's gorgeous, Alan. It's something, all right. I can't get over how much I like the entranceway to Diver's Isle. It has such a beautiful fairy tale vibe to it, everything kind of being a little off-kilter and hyper-angled. Adding to the sort of mystical, unsettlingly attractive vibe is that Diver's Isle was the name of Thomas Zane's island that supposedly sunk beneath the waves when the volcano erupted back in 1970. The cabin itself is actually called Bird Leg Cabin, which always reminded me of the Baba Yaga's hut from Slavic folklore that ran around on chicken legs, and we'll soon see why that is a very appropriate unconscious association that I had. Alan and Alice then discuss that they want to get inside before dark, as Alice is nectophobic, meaning she's afraid of the dark. Alan taking special care of his wife here proves that, while conflicted and often self-interested, he does genuinely care for his wife, and as he walks the island, he notes how calming it will be to just be with Alice and forget about his work, and he thinks... They can be happy here, but as night falls, things start to get interesting. Alan comes inside the cabin and is greeted by Alice's playful command to come upstairs where he finds her in her undergarments. But Alice isn't down to clown and says his surprise is actually in the study. Much to Alan's dismay, the surprise is a typewriter that Alice got him in hopes that he could break through his writer's block. She's been in contact with Dr. Hartman, having read his Creator's Dilemma book and thinking that he could help Alan because he specializes in struggling artists. Alan, as much enraged by his own self-loathing as her pity, storms past her, pushing her out of the way and cursing. I've got to say, this scene kind of hit me hard. When I used to be struggling with deadlines to write fiction pieces in college, my mother was always my editor, my proofreader, who always wanted to read what I'd written and provide tips. But I sometimes grew frustrated with the process and would lash out harshly at her, the only person who could really relate to what I was going through. Just to vent, not really meaning to offend, but nonetheless directing my anger unfairly at someone who had my best interest at heart. And I've done the same to my wife sometimes when I felt like she wasn't understanding my struggle to make YouTube videos or giving me enough space. It makes some darkly poetic sense, but writers do struggle with main character syndrome, with feeling like when you're in the zone or struggling to get there, that the world falls away, that it's to be manipulated until you arrive at a version that you're proud of, till people end up feeling like side characters in your story or pawns in your game to get what you want. Remedy does a very deft job of maximizing Alice's small screen time by making her feel intrinsically important to Alan, but possibly taken for granted, viewed through the myopic lens of an often loving, but sometimes self-centered, conceited, and vindictive husband. But showing Alan can be a very small man is actually a really bold choice on Remedy's part. Name the last hero you watched that was shown to be petty, argumentative, and shitty on a domestic level that wasn't, you know, call the police abusive. I relate a lot to the normality of Alan's problems. I can be petty, sensitive, and outright mean, especially when feeling jealous of how my self-expression is being received. Alice is a very important part of this story because she brings out love and protectiveness in Alan, but also reveals how deeply cynical and corrupted by an artist's often necessary self-centeredness that he is. All that to say, this emotional backdrop makes what happens next all the more dire. Alan storms outside, confident that Alice won't follow because she's afraid of the dark, but as he's brooding, Alice screams for him and... Alan rushes into the house to find the back railing broken through and Alice's body floating below in the black waters of Cauldron Lake. Oh no! <gasps> Alan dives in without hesitation like a modern day Orpheus descending into the underworld to find his Eurydice. He wakes up in a crashed car with a head wound, despite his last memory being diving into the dark water. And curiously, a copy of Dr. Hartman's book is in the trunk. Alan resumes his search for Alice on foot and decides he needs to reach a nearby gas station to use their phone. Remedy's open world being compacted down means that this section just really sings, as do many of the other outdoor sections. There's a realness to all of them, and yet they all have very good conveyance, which is the industry term for basically just letting you know where you should go next to progress. It's hard to express just how good these areas feel unless you're just in them. You know, hearing the ambient audio and noticing how organically populated they are with plants and trees and power lines and such. We'll also see soon just how alive with mystical menace these otherwise beautiful woods can be. It's just a truly excellent artifact of using the open world as a backdrop for your linear third-person shooter, which is very clever. 
Now, as Alan traverses these woods, he soon comes upon loose pages of a manuscript entitled Departure. Alan had actually been planning to use this name for an upcoming book, but he never gotten around to writing it. So, how was he credited as the author of this manuscript, and how does this manuscript even exist outside of his mind? The page you pick up describes Alan running into an axe-wielding man shrouded in darkness. And, not but a couple minutes later, Alan approaches a logging operation and runs smack dab into Carl Stuckey, but he's been taken over by the darkness and now wields an axe. The manuscript spoke of something like this just moments ago, but how did it know it was going to happen? The manuscript even commentates on this quandary, as Alan picks up a page that reads, At first I kept finding the pages as if by accident. The book I couldn't remember was either a terrible and true prophecy, or an act of creation that had rewritten the world. Now let's remember this distinction because while it can feel a bit semantic, I think it actually has huge implications for the Remedy Connected Universe and how it's possible that alternate realities, clairvoyance, art coming to life, and possibly even time travel can all be branches of the same metaphysical tree in this world's lore. Now back to the game. The prophesied, or possibly created, Dark Stucky punctuates his axe swings with disarmingly mundane platitudes like Two, two birds, incontestably proven health! before going all Jack Torrance and The Shining on a door that Alan's hiding behind. Alan arms himself, but the darkness overtakes a nearby machine that pushes the building he's in off a cliff, Alan jumping out just in the nick of time and disposing of his attackers. Alan then makes his way through the dark forest, starting generators to produce light sources and activating some machinery to progress. He notably also finds some glow-in-the-dark messages that guide him towards chests full of supplies, which sounds an awful lot like those glowing messages that were reported around Bright Falls in Clay Stewart's Alan Wake Files. He also finds some darkly humorous TV shows called Night Springs, a Twilight Zone knockoff about supernatural events happening to normal people. Curiosity often kills the cat in Night Springs. But once Alan reaches the gas station, a TV set clicks on with something far more alarming. Alan sees himself sitting in front of the typewriter in the bird leg cabin study, muttering about how he's surrounded by darkness, but can feel Alice's presence, and then he has to write a story that will come true to free her. While scrubbing through footage, I actually randomly stopped at this scene to write some notes and found that a poster in the gas station had the incontestably proven health benefits phrase on a poster, and I began to wonder. The dark place of Bright Falls has been said to thrive on unconscious or creative thought, and I'm thinking that could include subliminal messages or phrases that get stuck in your head but you can't quite say why you remember them. The taken generally speak in platitudes or cliches, so it seems likely that once possessed, their brains sort of resort to an automatic chanting of basic, almost meaningless subconscious phrases that are easy to remember. Hell, even Alan himself spoke very repetitively when talking about the darkness just now on the TV set, so it seems likely that this looping madness is a common side effect of the dark presence's influence, and possibly what makes it so hard to contend with and escape from. Fearing that he's losing his mind, Alan Wake calls the sheriff's station and soon, Sheriff Sarah Breaker shows up. Sheriff Sarah Breaker. Alan tells her his story, but she tells him that it can't be true since there's not an island in Cauldron Lake anymore, not since the 70s. But since Sarah's actually kind of a cool chick, she offers to take Wake up to the lake and see what's up. When they get there, much to Alan's shock, the island has totally vanished, leaving only a broken walkway, now leading down to nothing more than the dark depths of Cauldron Lake. The second episode opens with a flashback to Alice and Alan's New York apartment three years ago. Alice is working on her own photography project, but manages to find time to make some cover mock-ups for Alan's forthcoming Sudden Stop book. While doing so, the lights go out unexpectedly and Alice starts to freak out. Alan lights a bunch of candles and he comforts her on the couch by telling her a childhood story about how he too used to be afraid of the dark until his mother gave him an old light switch called the clicker. His mom told him that when he got scared, he should flip the switch and all the monsters would go away. Alan even seems to have the clicker still showing it to Alice, who laughs a bit thinking he just made this up on the spot to make her feel better, but he insists that it's true. The couple embraces and the scene fades out. Back in the present day, Wake awakes to find himself in the sheriff's department being treated for his injuries. In the middle of trying to tell Sarah what she needs to know while also trying not to sound crazy, Alan gets a phone call that sounds like Alice calling for help, and then a man's voice comes on the line, saying that if he wants to see his wife again, Alan will meet him with the departure manuscript at Lover's Peak inside of Elderwood National Park. 
To prove he's not messing around, the man tells Alan to check behind the sheriff's station for Alice's driver's license. While there, Alan receives a worried phone call from Barry. Ow! Ow! Thank God! Where the hell have you been? I've been trying to reach you for a week, you and Alice. I've been worried sick. I flew out yesterday. I'm here, here in Bright Falls. His wife in clear danger, he brushes Barry off and goes back inside the sheriff's station only to find Dr. Hartman is there apologizing for the Anderson brothers' escape earlier. Alan asks to leave, but Breaker says she needs to know where he's staying so she can get in touch with him. Hartman offers Alan lodging at his clinic, which pisses Alan off since he remembers that Alice and Hartman spoke about his writer's block, and he hauls off and slugs the shit out of Hartman. Hartman's suspiciously okay with Alan's moxie, saying he won't press charges. But if he did, he'd have to contend with the arrival of Barry, who comes in threatening to throw lawyers at anyone who mishandles Alan. Hey, nobody move! Get your hands off of my client! Who are you? I'm Barry Wheeler, his agent. Meet Barry, Alan's comic relief best friend for years and faithful agent, who's voiced by the guy who uses the same voice as he did in Max Payne 2 with Benny Cogniti. He's also got the most adorably wretched fashion sense, and I'm here for it. Like Alice, Barry is a nice foil to Alan's self-seriousness and mercurial attitude. He advises Alan not to lose his cool like he has in the past, though, which we find out in the Alan Wake files includes assaulting a paparazzi unprovoked and several other battery and drunkenness charges. Judging by how Alan bumped into his wife earlier, he's clearly not above using physical intimidation. Fortunately, while Barry may be an annoying, fast-talking New Yorker, he's also Alan's confidant and conscience, so Alan tells him everything that's happened since he got to Bright Falls, including Alice's disappearance, the manuscript, and the rest. Barry is skeptical about the supernatural stuff, but he definitely believes that Alice has been kidnapped. Alan appreciates his support, but says he has to go alone per the kidnapper's request, so he sets out for Lover's Peak, advising Barry to stay available in case he needs him. The trip through Elderwood Park to get there is scenic and full of excellent art design, with benign objects like wooden gates, park benches, and trees, hazed and menacing black fog and fierce winds doing all they can to unnerve you. One small detail I really liked is how we find a huge Douglas fir tree called the Great Old One, which is inside the Elderwood Park, which sounds very much like references to the Old Ones and Elder Gods from Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. These little, seemingly incidental references really set the tone for what the stakes are in the Remedy Connected universe. Humanity is coming up against unknowable, implacable alien presences that will manipulate and corrupt anyone they can get their hands on in order to secure more power more control, and we'll see a lot more of this once we get to the control section of this video. Not only that, but there are so many taken out here in the park, from pickaxe throwing guys to axe wielding bruisers with a nearly undodgeable charge attack. Generally speaking, Alan Wake's strategic combat considerations are pretty sweet, requiring you to balance holding the light onto enemies until you break their shields, but also making sure you don't get flanked by the other enemies and have to time dodges exactly not to get picked off, resulting in cool slow-mo animations that would make Max Payne proud. But Alan Wake has a couple things that disorient you unnecessarily in combat, and one is changing the shoulder over which you view Alan from right to left automatically, based on how far you've turned in either direction. This happens so frequently, even while exploring, and it can be a downright death sentence in combat when you're getting hit simply because you lost track due to a sudden camera switch. I'd also argue that the perfect dodge window was a little too exacting, resulting in so many restarts because you were a millisecond off and got whacked into oblivion. There's also an inexplicable lag to certain animations or a lack of response when you hit the buttons, like Alan refusing or taking forever to drop flares or flashbangs, which resulted in a lot of cheap deaths for me. Let's also not forget Alan's egregious athleticism. Alan may be a writer, but he doesn't look like a couch potato, and yet you'd never know it because this guy can run for maybe two seconds before keeling over in a paroxysm of panting and wheezing. While some encounters can just be run past and some are meant to be, far too many of them in Elderwood require a real luck of the draw to get through, past the auto-switching camera, dodge system, and ridiculously low stamina bar. The only exploit that I could find and hope to get away with was just to bunny hop my way through the forest to get to the satisfying thrum that accompanies each overhead light source. But even this was sometimes not up to the task of getting through those lightning quick melee animations. All these complaints in mind, Alan Wake's combat can be sensational as we'll see in later chapters, and the nightmare difficulty's silver lining is that encounters really feel like survival horror instead of just third-person action, putting the pinch on your reflexes and actually running you out of ammo sometimes. Nightmare really feels like a different game, and while sometimes not for the right reasons, there's enough here especially in the long combat sections of Elderwood Park to make you appreciate Remedy's balancing. But back to the story. Once you fought your way through a significant chunk of the park, we get to one of the most conceptually fun but kind of 
awkward gameplay sections. Alan loses his items and is about to be killed by Taken when he's saved by a man in a cap who's throwing flares like they're candy at a kid's birthday party, lighting up the Taken. He gives Alan some flares to use and tells Alan to cover him. Alan soon realizes that he saw this guy back on the ferry when he first arrived and realizes he's Alice's kidnapper but desperate times call for strange bedfellows, so he has to cover this piece of shit for now by weakening the ticket so the kidnapper can finish them off. Now, while I do love these kinds of gameplay remixes, like how Doom 3 had you shooting demons while a scientist held up a lantern in the pitch black darkness, these types of sections usually live and die by how good the AI is. And let's just say, our kidnapper should stick to his other night job because he can't hit the broadside of a barn from the inside. As epic as popping flares is and seeing the wreck taken, this section is a bit tough to love despite its ingenuity, although the standoff at the end of a nature lookout is pretty epic, I must admit. And once the danger has subsided, Alan interrogates the kidnapper and Alice's whereabouts, but he just responds cryptically that Alan's going to do incredible things once he gets some proper editorial control over his writings. The kidnapper then does the thing you don't do in Alan Wake, which is incite Alan by threatening Alice if he doesn't hand over the manuscript. So Alan instant so Alan initiate so Alan initiates Operation Sucker Punch yet again, and they fall over the railing in the scuffle. Alan retrieves the kidnapper's gun, but the kidnapper gets away, and calls Alan from afar to tell him he's got two days to deliver the manuscript to the coal mine nearby, where Alice gets it. Without the kidnapper's whereabouts or any manuscript to give him in return for Alice anyway, Alan decides to return to Barry and regroup. While doing so, we get our first vehicle section, which is an artifact of the game's initial open world concept. Much like how you boost the flashlight to burn darkness away from the Taken, so you do with the vehicle's headlights and can drive them over for quick satisfying finishers. Just be wary not to damage these vehicles because walking these areas is miserably tedious. I wouldn't say the game would be better or worse without these vehicle sections as they're fairly unremarkable, but these sections are a nice change of pace and provide some comeuppance to the Taken now that you've momentarily got the upper hand. We return to Barry, but find he's barricaded himself in because hordes of those ravenous shadow birds that we heard about in the Alan Wake files have surrounded the house, dive-bombing Alan until he can blast them with light. As intense as their screeches are as they descend, and how cool they look as they explode from flare gun fire, I can't pretend they're the most elegantly designed enemies, and they can be an absolute nightmare to determine where they're coming from, and then when to dodge without getting cheap shotted in the back. But persistence pays off, and the swarm defeated, Barry and Alan reunite and decide to split up, Barry going into town to try and ask around about the kidnapper, and Alan deciding he needs to write the man a manuscript to get Alice back. But his conscious effort to start writing seems supernaturally blocked. Fortunately, Rose calls Barry and tells him she's found the rest of Alan's manuscript, so perhaps there is still hope. The only problem? Rose is apparently being controlled by none other than the woman in funeral attire that gave Alan the key to Diver's Isle and set this whole shit show in motion. Alan and Barry drive over to the very Twin Peaksian trailer park, but before they can go in, Sarah Breaker calls and informs Alan that FBI agent Nightingale is here and wishes to speak with them. The boys go to retrieve said manuscript before heading over to the sheriff's station, and while they walk, Barry reveals that the eccentric lamp lady from the diner has actually written a bunch of articles about the strange occurrences around Cauldron Lake over the years, and about how Thomas Zane and Barbara Jagger both went missing near Cauldron Lake as well. The trailer park superintendent Randolph notes that the native tribes in this area used to call the lake a gate to the underworld. Weirder still, despite Weaver calling Thomas Zane a famous writer, there's no record of anything he ever wrote. The history lesson over, Alan and Barry arrive at Rose's trailer, but Rose doesn't seem to be herself. Worse is they become more aware that Rose doesn't even have the manuscript. They also discover too late that the coffee they've been given is drugged. These drinks have been drugged. Has a rather nice bite to it. Alan then experiences a vision where the voice from the dream warns him that the dark presence is wearing his barbarous skin and that Alan must turn the lights on. Based on the story we just heard from Barry, the voice from the light calling her his barber would imply that he's actually the spirit of Thomas Zane somehow reaching out to Alan. But the dark presence appears too in the form of Barbara Jagger and commands Alan to get back to work. Alan bolts wide awake in Rose's trailer, saying he's nauseous, which any writer worth his salt would tell you is grammatically incorrect. I felt nauseous, hungover. Only anger kept me going. Alan is nauseated, meaning he feels nausea. He is not nauseous, which means to cause nausea. 
Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. On the TV set nearby, Alan sends himself another message, this time about how a woman called Barbara Jagger is aggressively editing his manuscript till it's more hers than his, but she promises this will save Alice, just like it did when she worked with Thomas Zane. Sufficiently freaked out, Alan realizes his window to get the ransom manuscript to the kidnapper is closing, as he has less than 12 hours to deliver it. Worse yet, a manuscript page he finds outside lets him know that Randolph, the trailer park superintendent, has a soft spot for Rose, and so he's called the sheriff's office on Alan and Barry. Sirens sound as they close in, and searchlights bathe the night in accusative glares, threatening to expose Alan as he makes a run for it. Alan takes refuge in a nearby lookout point and uses the radio to overhear a police broadcast, saying Barry and Rose have been taken into their care, so at least they're out of harm's way, in theory. Alan sees a radio tower in the distance and remembers how kind the radio DJ Pat Main was, whose broadcast he's been listening to over the course of the night. Seems like just the kind of guy to try and get help from, so on we go. Wake walks straight into Main's radio station and Main welcomes him right in, but no sooner has he entered the studio than Agent Nightingale fires wildly into the station, almost hitting Pat Main and sending Alan crashing into the backyard and down the cliff. I had fallen off so many cliffs it was ridiculous. That's what you get for naming a book the sudden stop. The manuscript page Alan picks up here tells us how out of control Agent Nightingale has been, who's seemingly on a warpath for no reason against Alan. Alan makes his way through some more wooded countryside to the train depot, dropping flashbags like bright dynamite. I cannot tell you how singularly fun this is, nor how great it is to shoot these flammable canisters and watch the sparks fly. I've heard people trash Alan Wake's combat as repetitive, and I mean, I guess certainly sometimes it can be, but just like Control, when Alan Wake hits that sweet spot where the kinetic energy just explodes in satisfying ballets of violence and effects on screen, it's such a rush. And don't get me started on how stupid and also how awesome it is to have to take down a possessed bulldozer. <laughs> Remedy, you spoil me. The next day, Alan finally arrives at the mine early to get a look around while he waits for the kidnapper to show, but hours pass and the kidnapper never shows up. Night falls, and Alan's about to give up hope when the kidnapper calls again and says to meet him at Mirror Peak. Alan then makes his way through the forest, some train yards, and even a mine that provides some much-needed variety and intrigue to Alan's journey from a gameplay perspective. And it's probably the longest stretch of game where it just lets you fight and survive without constant narrative oversight, which is a good move as it makes the time feel like it's slipping away from Alan as he's given no input from the game that he's getting close to his goal. Once Alan reaches the base of Mirror Peak, he hears the kidnapper arguing with a woman, saying his boss didn't know who he was messing with and begs for mercy. He never had Alice and has no idea where she is, apparently just using this as leverage to get something out of Alan. Then out of nowhere, a dark cloud wrenches the kidnapper and Alan up into the air and down into the water below, Alan seeming to save himself only because he lights a flare in time to repel the darkness, falling like the Balrog in Fellowship of the Ring. Monty Zander made a point of praising the direction of this scene and I have to agree, it's beautiful and chilling all at once. And as the screen fades to black, a hand reaches down to grab Alan. Alan wakes up in one of the last places he wishes to be, in Dr. Hartman's clinic. The likely no-good doctor stands over him, telling him he's been brought here because of another episode of schizophrenia after Alice recently died. Alan's groggy from all the drugs in his system, but he's almost entirely sure Dr. Hartman's telling him a lie, so he has to bide his time and play along so he can figure out how to get out of here. Alan soon runs into the Anderson brothers again, named Odin and Tor, who were part of a heavy metal band in the 70s and 80s called the Old Gods of Asgard. Hartman insists that they're suffering from dementia brought on by sex, drugs, and rock and roll. As a gathering storm starts to make the lights flicker, Hartman excuses himself to go check on it, leaving Alan to catch up with the zany old rockers. Odin insists Hartman just doesn't get them. It takes crazy to know crazy. That's the sanest thing I've heard in a while. The brothers take a shining to him and call Alan both Zane and Tom as if they remember him from before and they invite him to go back to their farm out in the countryside. This is the second time they've called him Tom Zane, so either something about Alan is reminding them of their old friend or perhaps there's a metaphysical connection between the two that Alan just doesn't know about yet. But time will tell. Or Tom will tell. <laughs> Tor tells Alan that they wrote down everything he needs to get his head right, and they send him on his way. Alan goes downstairs to look for a way out, and sees another TV message from himself where he acknowledges that Barbara Jagger is not herself. She's being warned by the Dark Presence to manipulate him into thinking he was saving Alice, when in reality, he's been writing a horror story that it wants to become real. 
With that, the power goes out, and Alan finds that Barry's here too somehow, likely being kept as mentally unstable after being drugged by Rose. He and Barry find Hartman's office before Hartman catches up to them. Alan pulls a gun on him, and Hartman knows he's beaten, and he tries to convince Alan to join up with him in his evil plans, but the Dark Presence descends upon them and splits them up. Alan uses generators and various light sources that Hartman set up around the lodge, and then heads out into the hedge maze that surrounds the lodge. Once Alan gets past this murderer's row of Taken, he reconvenes with Barry, and they drive away. Before we continue with Alan and Barry's story, I do want to fill you in on what happens to Hartman the next day in the comic book Psycho Thriller. Hartman's work is in ruins after the lodge is overrun by the Dark Presence, and he reflects on how much he misses his old boss, Thomas Zane, through whom he first became aware of the powers of Cauldron Lake. Before he's had time to mourn the loss of his work, the kidnapper whom we last saw being taken away by the Dark Presence shows up as a Taken, and he's back to kill Hartman. The kidnapper, whom we learn is called Mott, has grown up searching for approval because of his absentee father and has covered up his insecurities by being aggressive, a great cliché, as Hartman notes. Regardless, these qualities make Mott easy to trick, and Hartman lures Mott into killing a patient of his by giving him his jacket so he can act as a decoy. Then, he ends up entrapping Mott by appealing to his vanity, then throwing a flare at him so he can be finished off by local law enforcement. Hartman calls somebody after this event, possibly the Federal Bureau of Control, saying he's reconsidered their offer and needs somewhere to go for a while. This comic book solidifies that Hartman is indeed manipulative to the point of murder to get his way, and is completely obsessed with controlling the power of Cauldron Lake for himself. We'll see later how his story pans out when we get to Control. For now, though, let's return to Alan and Barry the night before as they're driving away from Hartman's Lodge. Alan updates Barry that Alice isn't dead, but she is at the bottom of the lake, and the Dark Presence has been using his writings to create a reality to its own liking. Not only that, but somehow Alan surmises that the Dark Presence has done the same thing to Thomas Zane and the Andersons. To echo Avalanche Review's recent criticism of the scene, Alan's saying things he doesn't technically know yet. Ow! How can you know that? I know, Barry. I can... Al! I... No, listen. I can bring her back. I can find her. There's something special about this place. The lake, it, it does something to the works of art created here. It makes them come true. But there's a catch. The dark presence, whatever that thing is, twists it to its own ends. That's why all of this is happening. It's using my manuscript to take over everything. Al, I believe you. It happened to Thomas Zane before. It happened to the Andersons. I, I mean, there was one scene at the end of the last episode where Alice's sinking body is transposed over Alan's. So maybe that implies he saw a vision of this and assumed she was still there. But there's no indication that she was alive still. Even if the earliest TV message he sent to himself said he's so sure of her presence he could smell her perfume. I can feel her presence in the dark. Just now, I could smell her perfume in the room. I mean, that could have changed by now. Not only that, but technically speaking, the Andersons could just be nuts and not be influenced by the Dark Presence. Although, perhaps it's implied that since Hartman only seems to collect those touched by the Dark Presence at his lodge, that they've got to be touched as well. It's a small nitpick overall, as the details themselves are so cool you just want to get them out in the open, but they feel slightly unwieldy and unearned here. But what can you do? The info's out there, and with these revelations, the boys are ready for the next step in their job, finding the hidden messages at the Andersons' farm. As the boys make their way down, Alan finds another TV message from himself where he has started to realize in the writer's room that if he keeps writing the horror story that the Dark Presence wants, it'll kill Alice and everyone in Bright Falls and finally be free, unstoppable. Alan decides to write himself into the story as the protagonist, a terrible risk as he calls it, and hopes that he can change the story, save Alice, and keep the dark presence contained. But the interesting thing is that Cauldron Lake only brings to life authentic art, meaning Alan has to write a story that rings true and plays by the rules of fiction, meaning there will be victims, near escapes, and cliffhangers, and it can't be certain he will succeed. So, the drama of Alan Wake's story really comes down to whether Alan can become a truly great artist or remain something of a writer of disposable genre fiction. He's going to need to find these skills really quickly, too, because the fate of his wife and the whole town hangs in the balance. So on he and Barry push into the night until they finally arrive at the Andersons' farm. And for those of you Alan Wake devotees, you know what's coming. If you'll remember, the Anderson brothers used to be in a band called the Old Gods of Asgard, and they have kept up a stage out in their front yard where they used to perform. A Taken horde descends upon Alan and Barry, and they're forced to take the stage for the performance of their lives. And let me tell you, it is fucking awesome. <laughs> The stage fight is, without a doubt, the best part of Alan Wake, and honestly, it's still my favorite thing Remedy's ever done. There's a convenient cornucopia of flares, flashbangs, flashlight batteries, and ammo lying around, so you can tear ass with abandon. 
All the while, Barry's firing off stage fireworks to annihilate hordes in your blind spots. You get to upgrade your flashlight to a stronger version here, and all the game's weapons are present, which means you can go ham with the highly accurate and damaging pistol, the one-shot hunting rifle, and the beastly shotgun. Well, at least as long as you're not playing a nightmare. Normal lets you kill most enemies in one glorious shotgun blast, and maybe two for big enemies. But Nightmare nerfs this gun so badly it takes four or five shots to kill anything. No other gun has this amount of nerfing. But that's the only thing that can possibly damage how fun this section is even on Nightmare, just blowing away demon-possessed rednecks with your best bro. Speaking of your best bro, when Alan and Barry have successfully pulled off the best concert Bright Falls has seen in years, <laughs> that was awesome! Bright Falls, rock and roll capital of America. They go inside the Anderson's home and find a TV playing an old Night Springs episode, which Barry remarks was how Alan actually got started in the writing business. At first, they think Alan wrote this episode, but Barry says, nah, someone else did this. Which is weird, considering that the episode is about a Mr. Jones who walks across a dreamscape until he comes to a, wait for it, sudden stop. The name of Alan's last book. Mr. Jones stops to debate with another person about whether this is their dream or the dream of the man asleep on a bed next to them, who is supposedly dreaming all of them. Even a man in a diving suit, which sounds an awful lot like Thomas Zane to me. Mr. Jones' debate partner says that if this man wakes up, they'll all disappear, and when an alarm clock sounds, the dream collapses and the TV cuts to static. This reminds me a lot of something I found when researching Signalis, which was the creature called Manayu Sushay or Sushai from Lord Dunsany's Gods of Pagana. This godlike creature made a race of other gods and now sleeps forever, lulled to sleep by the music of drummers. But if he should wake, all the gods and the worlds in existence will cease to exist. This makes me think of Alan as the one who's playing God, as the hitchhiker in the dream accuses him of, killing whom he will for the story's benefit, and manipulating those in Bright Falls through his writings to serve the purposes of his story. And the only thing that might keep this from happening is another set of musicians, the Andersons or the Old Gods of Asgard. Maybe it's nothing, but I thought this was a pretty cool parallel to mull over. Speaking of the Andersons, Alan and Barry search their house top to bottom and find a record player playing another one of their old songs, the beautiful Poet and the Muse performed by the Old Gods of Asgard, just like the Elder Gods was, which any Remedy fan worth their salt knows is actually done by the real-life Poets of the Fall Band. Big shout out to those guys and Remedy for introducing me to one of my favorite bands with Max Payne 2's Late Goodbye. In the Poet and the Muse song, we hear the entire history of Thomas Zane and Barbara Jagger, as well as A Lady of the Light. And now to see your love set free, you will need the witch's cabin key. Find the Lady of the Light, gone mad with the night. That's how you reshape destiny. Alan and Barry surmise, a little too quickly, that this Lady of the Light must mean Cynthia Weaver, the lamp lady from the diner who also wrote all those articles about the lake and about Tom Zane and Barbara Jagger. They stay the night in the Anderson's house to wait for morning so they can go to Cynthia when it's safe. In the meantime, Alan and Barry try to pass the time by drinking up the Anderson brothers' moonshine, but their charming bro time is cut short by the fact that this moonshine has been cut with Cauldron Lake water and they both pass out. Alan experiences a repressed memory viewed as if by astral projection. After being unable to find Alice beneath the lake, the dark presence coaxed him back into the study to start writing departure. He's there for a week before he gets the idea of adding the bright presence or Tom Zane into the story to come rescue him, freeing him from the cabin and bringing him back to the regular world. Alan realizes that writing Zane into the story to help him has endangered him and thrown him even deeper into the dark place at the bottom of Cauldron Lake, another casualty of war it would seem. Alan then groggily found a car that he soon crashed, and we now see why he was in the state at the start of episode 2. This vision of his past over, Alan awakes to find himself under the gun of none other than the relentless Agent Nightingale. That's right, James Joyce. It's your fault, and you're gonna pay for it. Episode 5 opens with the citizens of Bright Falls gathering to celebrate Deerfest, and Pat Main notes that they hope to break the record held by Moosefest in nearby Watery. I only bring up this otherwise mundane detail because in the Alan Wake 2 promo videos, the other playable character Saga Anderson actually goes to Watery at one point in her investigation, and finds out that everyone there remembers a version of her even though she's never met them. Perhaps Watery is having an alter world event of its own, just like Bright Falls, but I digress. We cut to the Bright Falls Sheriff Station and Alan and Barry are shifting restlessly in their cell beds. Alan sees a strange vision of Cynthia Weaver saying that Thomas Zane wrote that someone will come for it when the time is right, so it must come true, and the key, likely the it he's writing about, is insurance for... something. 
Then, Alan and Barry are woken up by none other than Agent Nightingale, who thinks he's got them now that he's read the manuscript and can confirm that they have been conspiring to murder a federal agent. It's unclear how that would even be in the manuscript since Alan doesn't even know who Nightingale is, so either he's not playing with a full deck of cards or he knows something that's being intentionally kept from the audience. Huh, spoilers. He does. Sheriff Sheriff Breaker. Oh my god, that is so hard to say. Sheriff Sarah. Sheriff Sheriff Barra. Okay. (laughs) Sheriff? Sarah Breaker, or you know what, I'm just going to go back to calling her Sarah. Sarah isn't putting up with Nightingale's asshole routine and asks to speak to his superior. Nightingale waffles, saying that's uh, not possible right now. And Sarah says she trusts Alan because Nightingale's clearly drunk and not here under any official FBI capacity. Nightingale draws his gun in a panic, but before he can fire, he pulls out a manuscript page and reads it as if checking some detail. We find out later it says this. He took out his hip flask when he reached the page that described how he reached the page that made him take out his hip flask. It wasn't the booze that made his mind reel. Dazed and confused by what he reads, Nightingale's then whisked away by the dark presence, just like the kidnapper was, a fitting end to an awfully written character. (laughs) Let's pause here briefly. I do not understand why Remedy handled Nightingale this way. He's a drunk idiot who tries to murder Alan every chance he gets and endangers innocence every time. He also has a so silly and endearing way of calling Alan by some writer's name like Brett Easton Ellis or Raymond Chandler as a taunting nickname. James Joyce, Raymond Chandler, Brett Easton Ellis, Stephen King. But as far as the game's concerned, Nightingale's a paper-thin antagonist who acts like a crazy person, and before he's given any chance to be understood, he's killed off. But the good news is that Clay Stewart, our author of the Alan Wake Files, manages to find out more about what makes Nightingale tick when he finds his belongings in the Majestic Hotel Room. So I'll share that with you now. Clay Stewart discovered in Nightingale's journal that he once had a partner named Finn, a perhaps on-the-nose joke about Remedy being Finnish. This excerpt shows that Nightingale didn't start out bad, and he's crushed by the loss of his partner, his second wife as he calls him, which makes him something of a mirror to Alan who's lost his wife. This partner seems to have been lost to the Dark Presence, and Nightingale feels responsible for stopping it. So perhaps the Dark Presence was operating locally where Nightingale was, and that's what drove him here. But because of Nightingale's bloodlust for Alan and the fact that he has newspaper clippings of seemingly unrelated events like Barbara Jagger's death in 1970 and Alan's recent run-ins with the law, Clay speculates that Nightingale must have had some dream or vision that connects these two disparate pieces of evidence, including the details of Zane and Jagger's lies, but also Alan's identity, meaning it would have to be both a dream about the past, but also the future. Like many of the finer details in Alan Wake, it's hard to really know why or what even happened concerning the most complicated rules of the lore, like what Nightingale actually saw, but we can tell that something profound made Nightingale snap, as he was an otherwise respected agent before his partner died, and while investigating Wake in Bright Falls, he's shown to be caring and empathetic when the need arises. But he either became an alcoholic or increased his intake to cope with his partner's death, and will now stop at nothing to get revenge for what is an understandably awful tragedy. Does that make Nightingale a good character? No, but it does make him a better one, and I wanted to pass that along to you in the chance that you've never heard of the Alan Wake files before and might totally miss this dimension of the character that is mysteriously missing from the game. Now we've got one more sighting of Nightingale, but that'll come much, much later, so let's return to the aftermath of the Dark Presence taking Nightingale away from the sheriff's station and how Alan, Sarah, and Barry escape this sudden invasion. Alan lets Sarah know his plans to see Cynthia Weaver, and Sarah offers the services of her police chopper to get them over there to the decommissioned power plant where she lives. She commissions Barry to stay behind, though, and call a list of people, giving them the code word Night Springs. The DJ Pat Main is on the list, as is Sarah's dad, Frank Breaker. And though we leave Barry for now, we'll actually get to find out soon what happens once he calls these folks a little bit later on. And we see one of the funniest visuals on a Remedy game, that of Barry wearing freaking Christmas lights to ward off the Taken. You gotta admire his New York gumption and ingenuity. What? What are the Christmas lights for? Protection, man! Like garlic against vampires? Vampires. In the meantime, Alan and Sarah pair up, and let me tell you, Sarah is just a cool chick. I actually like her a lot more than her counterpart in Twin Peaks, Sheriff Truman, who was kind of a doofus I never really believed was an actual law enforcement officer. Nobody's perfect. Isn't that the truth? (laughs) She's capable, reasonable, conscientious, and respectable, and level-headed. Her AI really sells her competency and dependability, too. She's got no wasted movement and confidently tags enemies with flashlights or blows anyone away that Alan's already weakened. A stark contrast to the erratic aim of Mott earlier when you made an uneasy alliance with him. (laughs) You 
serious? Finally, the dynamic duo make it to the helicopter and have to take a dramatic stand to secure it from the Taken. Getting to the power plant proves quite the ordeal, though, as the trio have to get past swarms of Taken birds, which eventually separate them as the helicopter can't take their onslaught, and so it has to drive away, leaving Alan to leg it the rest of the way on his own. This section has one of my favorite little quirks in it. Remedy lead writer Sam Lake said that one of the biggest challenges to Alan Wake's development was the acronym BETS or BETS, meaning bringing the enemies to the scene. And you can see why they still have some trouble justifying how enemies pop up, what with all the camera zooms and musical stingers every time an enemy spawns in. One funny oversight I saw in the power plant area was this one enemy whose entrance isn't covered up by any smoke and mirrors at all, so he just appears out of thin air. Let's see that in an instant replay. So he just appears out of thin air. Guess you can't win them all, huh? But once Alan dispatches he and the rest of his ilk, he enters the power plant and meets the Lady of the Light herself, Cynthia Weaver. About time! Young man, I've been waiting a very long time for you. Cynthia fills us in on the backstory of Thomas Zane and Barbara Jagger and the ongoing fight with the Dark Presence. Cynthia had a huge crush on Thomas Zane, the famous poet, but it was Barbara Jagger who won his heart eventually, and Cynthia had to admit that they were a lovely couple. But when Barbara died, Zane tried to write her back to life. But because the rules of the Dark Place don't allow for such wish fulfillment, as the gains have to be artistically earned, Barbara came back, but only as a shell inhabited by the Dark Presence, which was now much stronger than ever due to the misuse of its power. Zane realizes his mistake and tries to write himself and all of his work out of existence in hopes it will undo the Dark Presence. His famous career as a poet now forgotten by the world, except Cynthia, somehow, he uses her infatuation with him to convince her to build the well-lit room in the dam to keep an insurance policy safe, which is what Alan had a vision about in the sheriff's station a little while back. This insurance has been waiting for Alan, and everyone here is a character trapped in a story that Alan has written. When asked how Cynthia knows this, she says, That's the way he wrote it. He still... This is a really interesting answer from her because it sounds to me like Zane wrote that Alan Wake would write a story someday that would go this way in hopes of defeating the Dark Presence once and for all. Which leads me to question, did Zane write Alan Wake into existence for his own purposes? And if so, it's strange that Alan could also direct Zane to come free him from the Dark Place after his week of writing and other effects. Judging by the re same reason we can't bring Barbara back to life, it seems unlikely that he could just manifest Alan into existence. But we'll get more into this later. This is where Alan Wake starts to get way more complicated than the characters seem to acknowledge or the writers really burden you with to know in order to care. It's good storytelling as it doesn't sacrifice the pace and it keeps our goals in plain sight, but the brain worms are starting to fester. This moment of revelation is interrupted by a phone call from Barry who's in trouble and we hear a helicopter crash sending Alan into a frenzy. <laughs> We gotta go see if they're okay. He tells Cynthia to go on ahead and meet him later at the well-lit room because his best friend's in danger. Fortunately, Barry and Sarah survive the crash. They fight to the dark presence at the top of the dam and meet back up with Cynthia who leads them to the well-lit room. Up ahead is a huge vault door which houses the insurance policy that Thomas Zane had Cynthia keep for him all these years. She implores Alan to take it and relieve her of the burden of keeping it completely lit without shadows for nearly 40 years. What Alan sees at the center of the room utterly stuns him. On a manuscript page inside of a shoebox is a story from his childhood that only he would know, and yet he didn't write it. Thomas Zane did. The page was autobiographical, a memory from my childhood. But I didn't write this. It was a page written by Thomas Zane. None of them were supposed to exist anymore. Alan, seven years old, would fight sleep to the bitter end. When he did sleep, he soon woke up, screaming the nightmares fresh in his mind. One evening, his mother, sitting by his bed, offered him an old light switch. She called it the clicker, and flicking the switch would turn on a magical light that would drive the beast away. To imbue the talisman with all possible power, she added that it had been given to her by Alan's father. Alan never knew him, and anything of his took on mythical proportions in his mind. With the clicker firmly in his hand, Alan finally slept like a baby. Now, almost 30 years later, Alan thought of this as he stood on the rim of Cauldron Lake, the clicker in his hand. 
He took a deep breath and jumped. My mind swirled. I'd given the clicker to Alice, yet it was here. Zane had written it into existence in a story I had written. I can get to her now. I can finish this. Back in the present, Alan's head is spinning as he wonders how Zane could know about this real life story. We'll have some more theories about how this is possible, but for now, the dream logic suffices, and Alan is confident that he has what he needs to defeat the Dark Presence, rescue Alice, and return to the world they once knew. Episode 6 opens with another New York flashback, this time set two years ago. Alan wakes up with a hangover and gathers some sunglasses and painkillers to dull the pain, likely a funny little meta-reference to Max Payne. Fancy seeing you here. Alan listens to a voicemail message that Barry left him about how Alice chewed him out about how crazy they got at a party last night and that her nagging isn't doing his career any favors. Alan then turns on a late night interview from the night before where the host brown noses him about his latest book, The Sudden Stop. Alan notably says he killed off his main character, Alice Casey, so that he could try new things and that his next book will be a departure from the old. Alan goes on to say that he's happily married and that his wife is his muse. This otherwise innocuous, even complimentary word, muse, hit me wrong on this playthrough, making her sound like a useful addition to his life, hence her worth. In keeping with this theme, when Alice walks in from getting the groceries, she bends down to put stuff in the fridge and the camera follows her backside in a way that would make Kojima proud. She and Alan fight about how he said he was going to be home at midnight and didn't show up until 7 a.m. And Alice makes the peace by being understanding and not using it as an excuse to hammer Alan about how inconsiderate he's being. As composer Petriolanco said, Alice, she bends, but she doesn't break. Without Alice's uh, flexibility, um, they probably would have divorced or parted a long time ago. The biased male perspective in this scene almost makes me question whether this was a vision influenced by the Dark Presence, but had a conceit it's likely just Rimby telling us that Alan takes her for granted too often and that we are seeing her from his perspective as the main character, cropped up by useful side characters who propel his career, keep his ego and his emotional state intact, who contribute to his story. We'll revisit this point soon in the first DLC, but for now, we the audience are work back to the present. Alan realizes that the clicker is actually the key to the cabin that the old gods of Asgard sung about, and he idly clicks it as if to test its power. He then informs the game that he has to return to Cauldron Lake to read the last manuscript page, which is still in the typewriter in the cabin, and then he can write the perfect ending to save Alice, avoiding the mistakes that Zane made. Sarah offers to help, but then Alan does what I think is one of the most inexplicable things in the game. He pulls a gun on her and says that he has to do this alone. Sarah only meant to be helpful, and judging by the fact that she sided with Alan every other time, she probably would have just listened to Alan if he told her to stay behind. So this response from Alan doesn't just seem dickish, it seems completely out of left field. I only comment on it because it seems so strange. Fortunately, this scene is saved by a touching and tearful farewell from Barry, who wishes Alan luck. As goofy as Barry is, the writers always keep him true to Alan. He's genuine. He's a rock, and I'm not just talking about his physique. Barry's heartfelt final moment in Alan Wake is found in a nearby manuscript page. I don't think I'm ever going to see him again, he said in a weak voice. Sarah didn't have it in her to be mad at him. Besides, he was probably right. This actually really got to me on this last playthrough, and it's getting to me right now as I write, because as fans, we've all waited 13 years to see Alan Wake again, and Barry's now waited just as long. I wish I didn't say that. Yeah. We get to see Alan in the dark place in Alan Wake 2, but Barry, he may never see his friend again and never know what happened to him, and that is truly heartbreaking. But alongside this departure comes comfort in a touching reunion, which brings us to the Night Springs comic book starring Sarah Breaker's father, former Sheriff Frank Breaker. If you'll recall, Frank's name was on the list that Sarah gave Barry to call and give them the code word Night Springs. He immediately calls someone named Kirkland and tells them the code word's been used. For those control players out there, you will recognize Kirkland as the head of investigation for the FBC. Kind of amazing that this was all in place in a 2011 comic book, a full eight years before Control was released. Turns out, Frank Breaker used to work for the FBC and has fought off the Dark Presence's creations before, so he's fully aware of how weird shit can get out here, and has been an informant on the ground for the FBC ever since. And despite retiring from the FBC and from being a sheriff, Frank's organized a secret group of Bright Falls best, like Pat Main and several deputies, including the somewhat dense Mulligan who showed up in the Bright Falls prequel and on the police radio channel earlier. All these guys together seem very much like the Bookhouse Boys in Twin Peaks. 
They gather together and split off to do some separate missions around town, Frank going after Sarah when she calls to tell him that she's with Cynthia at the well-lit room. He fends off hordes of Taken but is eventually overwhelmed, and as an impending death blow descends upon him, Alan's first idle click of the clicker switch turns the night into day and burns all the Taken away just in time. A wounded breaker struggles to the dam, catching sight of Alan in the distance as he sprints away for Cauldron Lake. Frank makes his way down into the well-lit room where Sarah tries to comfort a distraught Barry, and father and daughter have a sweet reunion. Whether or not we'll see more of them in Alan Week 2 is anybody's guess, but there is one interesting detail related to the breaker lineage that we'll get to later. As for Alan, who we just saw sprint past, he's taking full advantage of the daylight to get to Cauldron Lake and fulfill Zane's prophecy. Along the way, Alan picks up a chilling piece of the manuscript that reveals the Dark Presence is no longer interested in influencing him as it realizes he's too powerful now, and is instead going to try everything in his power to kill him. The Dark Presence was no longer trying to capture the writer so he could create the ending it wanted. The writer knew too much. He was too strong. The Dark Presence forces the day to turn to night and promptly starts attacking. All bets are off now and the race is on. The Dark Presence literally throws everything that's got at Alan, sending hordes of Taken after him, tearing at bridges beneath his feet, and pelting him with inanimate objects. Alan fiercely rebuffs it with all manner of light, until he reaches the top of Mirror Peak, which sits adjacent to the Dark Tornado that's swirling up from the Dark Place. Thankfully, the spectacle of shooting your flare gun into the swirling miasma of debris and dark energy is worth the price of admission because this quote-unquote boss fight is the opposite of engaging, tasking you with just pot-shotting it to the last cutscene plays. Cool as hell to look at, no doubt, but this could have been done a lot better. Thankfully, the cutscene you earn is really good, and it goes down as one of my favorite endings ever. It's satisfying and yet alluring as it opens up the dimensions of the game world even further, leaving you wanting more. So let's take a look. So, once the tornado has been defeated in one side of combat, Alan stands at the edge of Mirror Peak, clicker in hand as Zane wrote, takes a deep breath, and jumps into the even deeper Cauldron Lake below. Alan wakes up in his apartment to find Alice in the clothes she was wearing, or <laughs> not wearing, when she disappeared. Only now, she's strangely not afraid of the dark like she should be. Alan knows that this is a ruse by the dark presence, and he burns away the floating word clicker with a flashlight and clicks it once more, striking a damaging blow against the dark presence and enveloping the scene in light. Wake or gains consciousness in another plane, where Zane can be found floating in his diver's suit. He tells Alan he must find the cabin and end this. What happens next is one of the most important and confounding pieces of lore in all of Alan Wake. As Alan listens to Zane, we see an exact double of him materialize next to him, grinning eerily. Zane seems suspiciously fine with this occurrence, advising Alan not to worry about the new Alan whose name is Mr. Scratch, and that Alan's friends will meet him when he's gone. Zane admonishes Alan to use the clicker, and then disappears. Alan's left to burn away more words until he finds the relevant ones that materialize what he needs to progress to the cabin. Now, while he's doing this, some really interesting stuff happens. The Dark Presence starts messing with Alan, giving him supposedly false memories like Alice saying she's leaving Alan for another man. But then we hear the scene switch to a similar argument between Zane and Barbara, where he's realized that she's been possessed by the Dark Presence, and he comes after her with a knife. The kicker? Tom isn't voiced by James McCaffrey as he is the rest of the game. He's voiced by Matthew Peretta, Alan's voice actor. So Zane is speaking with Alan's voice here. You're not my Barbara. Tom, let me go. I promise to be good. Please, untie me, you naughty boy. I will help you out your mistakes. I will love you forever. No, you're not Barbara Jagger. I made a terrible mistake. I should have never written you back. You came back wrong. Your heart is filled with darkness. Put that knife away, Thomas. Put it down. Is this real or another weird lie? And if it's a lie, what deceit is it actually trying to pull off? It seems more like an intentional contrast between the two sets of lovers fighting for their relationship against supernatural evil. And I'll be honest, I've not seen anyone do anything with this idea, so it's perhaps just something to write off, but very little that Remedy does in the Remedy Connected universe seems throwaway, so I'd keep an eye out for this in the sequel. But once Alan's burned away enough words and endured the Dark Presence's psychological warfare, he gets to enter the cabin. The Dark Presence in Barbara's form taunts him, and he promptly responds by filling that bitch up with a light grenade in the form of the clicker, resulting in this excellent visual of light pouring out of her mouth and eyes as the Dark Presence is wiped off the face of the cosmos.
good riddance. The witch defeated, we hear our muse Alice's scream and see Alan diving in once more after her. Then Alice can be seen swimming up to the surface from the depths of Cauldron Lake, and she exits back onto the shore, the steps broken down and Diver's Isle missing as it truly is in real life. She calls Alan's name, but he's gone. Another heartbreaking departure. Back in Bright Falls, the residents of the town put on a deer fest celebration for the ages, and we see the waitress Rose looking much better than she did earlier. In fact, she looks to have literally picked up the torch from Cynthia Weaver, as she now holds a lamp too, another person touched by darkness, but holding on to the light. Behind her looms the dark specter of Agent Nightingale, proof that the fight continues. Back in the cabin, we see Alan is now writing again, likely trying to perfect the ending to Departure, but the last sentence he writes is confounding and spine-chilling. I think it's one of the coolest lines ever uttered in a video game. It's not a lake. It's an ocean. Alan, wake up. Actual chills go up and down my spine every time I hear that and even as I write and record this sentence. Alice is saved, but Alan's stuck here, and he's discovered or possibly even wrote into existence that the dark place is not confined to a lake, but is greater in scope, like an ocean, or is connected to other dimensions, like a river to an ocean. But before we break out into theory crafting, let's continue our recap with the Signal and Writer DLCs, which pick up right after Alan Wake proper ends. The Signal DLC begins with Alan explaining how the toll that a difficult undertaking like the creative process can have on you, feeling accomplished but also empty after this thing that's been driving you is gone and doesn't need your help anymore. Alan, listen to me. Go no deeper. What? Alan is then visited by Thomas Zane, who warns him to go no deeper into the dark place and to follow the Signal to make contact with him so he can help Alan. He outfits Alan with a flashlight and a gun, noting that these have power here not because of what they are, but because of what they represent, which is likely another nod to how the dark place is similar to the astral plane from Control, which can be reached when touching objects imbued with certain symbolic weight because of Jung's collective unconscious concept. Much like the TV messages from outside the dark place, Alan's seeing disturbing visions of himself as if he's still writing in the cabin, and notes that something went wrong after he finished the departure manuscript. Alan even finds other manuscripts with addled, incoherent thoughts, as if a part of him is still in the cabin writing in vain to escape. Alice was freed, but Alan's now trapped here in her place, so why didn't it work for both of them, and why does it feel like he's back where he started? Even stranger, a cell phone appears out of thin air with an inexplicably working GPS signal, and Zane tells us to use it so they can meet up. The dream logic is starting to get really strong here. He sees visions of himself calling his own work trash, and giant copies of his sudden stop book crash down from the sky or swarm like birds in bloodthirsty attempts to kill their creator. When Alan finally reaches Zane, he receives this grim news. This whole ordeal is happening within Alan's mind and is a product of his own self-loathing and insecurity about his work that brought on his writer's block. The Signal's final boss is actually the embodiment of these fears, a weird amalgamation of floating TVs that are broadcasting Alan's insane rants. Once the TVs are defeated, Alan returns to himself, but unfortunately himself is losing his mind on the floor of the cabin. If I'm being honest, this DLC is fairly short anticlimactic and random feeling, but it does up the stakes and the atmosphere, pushing us towards no-holds-barred psychological horror instead of spooky action thriller. So while the signal can feel a bit ephemeral, it is a necessary evil to get to the writer DLC, which adds some juicy mystery and caps off this epilogue very nicely. Zane, you have done well, Alan. Now I can accompany you. You are trapped in your own dream. You must wake yourself up, but first, you have to reach yourself. The writer DLC starts with Alan realizing that he's trapped in his own dream, a warping reality of distorted memories. The Alan that we control is actually the rational side of Alan's mind, and thus why Zane has made contact with him. He reveals that part of Alan wants to give in, but he must wake up from his dream in order to reach the rest of himself back at the cabin. This journey to rescue himself involves him reaching a lighthouse in the distance, somehow, so off he goes. Along the way, Alan questions how there are two parts of himself out there. So there are two of me? Yes. And the one you called Mr. Scratch, he's me as well? No. Zane, are you playing some kind of game with me? I am not the author of your story. How can you say that when you wrote that page about me and the clicker? It wasn't one of my pages. You directed me to it. You had Weaver guard it. Yes, she was needed. 
and you needed to click, but I am not. And then he trails off before disappearing for the rest of the game. But don't worry, this isn't the last we'll see of him by any means in our video today, and we'll learn much more about his strange behavior soon enough. For now, though, let's get back to Alan. In the DLC's final areas, we finally get to see Alan's abilities evolve, and he begins to do cool stuff like cause avalanches by burning away the word for it with his flashlight, which is likely what Remedy had in mind for him all along, as this type of rewriting reality mechanic has been seen in Alan Wake 2's promo stuff. A more interesting change of scenery happens, though, when Alan reaches the top of the lighthouse, but is suddenly transported to Dyra's Isle, where Bird Lake Cabin is. Alan notes that this change doesn't surprise him as much as it could, as he's starting to understand how the dark place flows. Alan rushes into the cabin and finds himself on the floor freaking out. He reaches down to rouse himself, and his two parts come together, making him whole. He realizes he's not made of sterner stuff like Zane is, and that he might not get a second chance to come back if his thoughts ever stray like this again. So he sits down at the typewriter and begins another manuscript, this time called Return, the final stage of Joseph Campbell's monomyth, which can be found on that Hero with a Thousand Faces book you always hear as the inspiration for Star Wars. It will be difficult, perhaps impossible, to leave this place, so once again, Alan Wake must temper his own madness and channel it as a force of creation. And thus ends the first full season, or chapter, of Alan Wake's journey. My name is Alan Wake, and I'm a writer. Alan's story continues in American Nightmare and Control, but in order for us to understand and appreciate both fully, we actually need to step back and finish the chapter on Thomas Zane, Alan's analog and mentor in The Dark Place. The most revealing insight into his backstory comes in the form of the This House of Dreams blog, which released several months after American Nightmare in 2012 and was set up like an unassuming regular blog that you can go to and read right now. The blog is written by Samantha Wells, a woman who's chronicling the renovations to an old house she just bought in the town of Ordinary, which she'll soon realize is anything but ordinary. The blog's name is a play on the House of Leaves book by Mark Z. Danieluski, which inspired parts of Alan Wake and Control, but is also a play on the term Dream House, or a house literally made or associated with dreams, as we'll soon see. Shortly after moving in, Samantha finds a curious shoebox upstairs filled with photos of a diver and a woman with their faces obscured and a bunch of poems alongside them. These poems reference things like a dark presence, oceans, diving, elements of Barbara Jagger's possessed form like a veil, and even famous Zane poems like the one about an ocean green where the waves are wilder and more serene, quoted in the opening scenes of Alan Wake, and another commonly quoted line, Beyond the shadow you settle for, there is a miracle illuminated. Soon after finding the shoebox, Samantha starts having strange nightmares, the first of which features a federal agent with a dark, smoky face and AWE emblazoned on his jacket knocking on her front door, and he asked about the shoebox. In Control, AWE stands for Altered World Event, which is a term applied to supernatural occurrences where a threshold was opened between worlds, like when the Dark Presence was awakened in Alan Wake. But AWE here is actually the old name for the FBC, and it used to be the Federal Bureau of Altered World Events, as evidenced by this trademark filing by Remedy. It's pretty spiffy to see that even back in 2012, Sam Lake and company already knew where they wanted to take Alan Wake and his associate properties. Samantha's second dream involves meeting the previous owner of her house, who is described as very handsome and wearing a funny jacket with elbow patches, which sounds like Alan. He screams for her to turn the lights on even though it's daylight outside. Her third dream involves seeing shadow men outside of her window, most likely the Taken. Soon, Samantha's contacted by what is likely the FBC, who advise her to stop posting about these strange occurrences at her house, as this has happened before elsewhere, and certain people, hint, 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 will do anything to get their hands on what she has in the shoebox. Samantha decides that she does not appreciate threats and keeps posting, noting that the shoebox eventually fills up with a weird light switch, which has to be the clicker, and it also fills up with new poems somehow. Some of these seem to have huge implications for the future of Alan Wake as a franchise, but I'll leave those to the theory crafting section a little later on as they're just mammoth ideas to unpack. For now, let's focus on the last entry on the blog called Diving Deep, which explains Thomas Zane's history and nature in incredible detail. Samantha is visited by a floating diver who tells her a dark presence took over his girlfriend, the woman in the photos. We know that he means Barbara Jacker, of course, and he says that he tried to erase her and himself from existence through his pawns, but to no avail. She was still possessed by the dark presence he'd awoken by trying to resurrect her. He now realizes that the dark presence is bigger than just the lake, even bigger than the universe we're in. As Alan said, it's not a lake, it's an ocean, a phrase that is actually found in a footnote of one of Zane's poems that Samantha finds. 
But Zane has found out how the dark place works, and so he wrote a secret poem and took Barbara's processed form for one last dive, and as they sink deeper, they are met by beings of light and darkness. Zane explains that while his girlfriend was taken over by a dark presence, a bright presence had taken over him, and he surrendered his physical form to it. But his essence, his soul, kept diving deeper along with the soul of Barbara. Then he recites the secret poem, and the power of the dark place allows him to transform his words into an island in the sea of darkness, a baby universe where he and Barbara could reside happily thereafter. But their physical forms would drift back up to the surface and be worn as uniforms by the dark and bright presences in the ongoing battle between light and darkness. So, yeah. Wow. It's not often that Remy just comes out and says what's going on in the lore of their connected universe, but this is pretty explicit and pretty big. It confirms Alan's revelation that the dark place is huge, and if it really is bigger than our universe, I don't know how Alan's ever going to make it out. But what's most interesting is that we may know now why Thomas Zane seems so confused in the writer DLC about whether he wrote things into existence or not for Alan's benefit. To this point, everything's pointed to the shining light and the diver suit guy being the same guy, right? Same voice, same helpful attitude, same knowledge of this place. But when Zane starts to falter, I begin to wonder if it's the bright presence wearing Zane's form that's waffling. Because it didn't technically write anything and can't claim the credit for it, Zane did. Now, why it picks this one random detail to suddenly dissociate from Zane is definitely not something I can explain, as it seemed perfectly fine before calling Barbara my Barbara, and other phrases that indicate he identifies very closely with Thomas Zane as he was. Now, this is all pretty confusing, and like the Stephen King quote at the beginning of Alan Wake, I don't know that there are any real answers, or if there are any lined up. There's a lot of dream logic, even the explicit information in the Remedy Connected universe. But we can at least note that we know that the Diver was a likely benevolent force wearing Zane's form, much like how the Dark Presence wore Barbara's, and that the two of them represent many like them in a battle between the forces of light and dark that has gone on for God knows how long. One of Zane's poem footnotes states that the Dark Place existed before creation, even calling it the darkness upon the face of the deep, a phrase from the first verse of Genesis in the Bible, a very cauldron lake sounding void before God created any physical matter. Crazier yet, Zane knows that he can be a creator like this too, and it's happened many, many times before, and we'll revisit this idea soon when we hit control and our view of the world really starts to zoom out. But before we get too sidetracked, let's figure out why the bright presence Zane seems so cool with Mr. Scratch taking on Alan's form and returning to the world to meet Alan's friends. This guy looks seriously creepy with his villainous leer, and as American Nightmare reveals, he is an actual piece of shit. Huh, who knew, right? Alan Wake's American Nightmare released in 2012 on Xbox Live Arcade for just $15, which so many games like I Am Alive and Call of War as Gunslinger proved was a sweet spot for games with very tight vision and well-tuned concepts. Man, could modern AAA development really learn a thing or two from this era? American Nightmare is a standalone, expansion type of experience with much improved gameplay over the first game. Alan can now sprint for quite a while, his aiming is more precise, and though the camera still shifts from shoulder to shoulder at times and there's still some input lag when throwing flashbangs, they're far less frequent. There's also a greater emphasis on semi-automatic weapons like an SMG, a nail gun, and even a combat shotgun, all of which are unlocked by collecting manuscript pages, the most powerful weapons requiring the most pages to be collected. The sound effects are punchy and satisfying, and the action just flows very freely. It's something you actively want to engage in just for its visceral pleasures, rather than just because the game is forcing you to in order to survive. There's also ammo and item refill stations placed liberally throughout, so you're always able to keep the onslaught going. The gameplay is so smooth and addictive, in fact, that Remedy even offered up some original challenge maps that pitch you against waves of Taken, including saw-wielding hulks, and these cool enemies that break apart into copies of themselves if you flashlight them instead of just shooting them. You have to survive under a time limit against increasingly tough waves, getting score multipliers for enemies killed in a row without dying and such, and getting certain high scores will net you some achievements. It's overall a very fun package and something that you can just play and have fun with without feeling like you're only here for the story. Oh, it's you. Something horrible is coming. He's called Mr. Scratch. He's after my wife, Alice. Do you know the real difference between us? I'm not afraid to be the center of attention. I can't return to the real world, I've tried, but I'm operating on dream logic, forcing the door open a crack so I can slip through. Fiction wants to come true. 
And speaking of story, American Nightmare adds a lot of wrinkles on Alan Wake's lore that carry over into the forthcoming sequel and control. American Nightmare takes place about two years after Alan Wake, both in real time and in the game's universe, and it plays out on a TV screen inside of Barry Wheeler's hotel while he sleeps, resting from being the new manager of the recently reformed Old Gods of Asgard band. Our story begins with Alan telling us he's still stuck in the dark place, despite the dark presence being defeated. But there's no rest for the wicked as Alan's doppelganger Mr. Scratch has risen to power and is coming for Alan. Scratch was created by the bad press and rumors about Alan that had come from his alcoholic and violent misbehavior in public, a sort of negative kinetic energy manifested into a self-destructed mirror image. So apparently, while the Dark Presence entity needed artists, or at least preferred artists it could operate through in order to actualize its intentions, the Dark Place dimension itself does not require such instruments if given the right ingredients from the collective unconscious. It seems that if enough people believe a thing strongly enough, then it can become real. Remember this later for Alan Wake 2 when we start talking predictions. This is also exactly how the astral plane works in control, too, as otherwise mundane objects can be made into objects of power if imbued with the right amount of sentimental attachment or value placed upon them by people, just like what the clicker and Alan's typewriter have become. Alan also notes that while Tor and Odin Anderson and the Old Gods of Asgard are using stage names, ever since they adopted the names of these Norse gods, they started to feel more and more godlike to Alan, almost as if the power of the Dark Place is allowing them to manifest or embody the meaning they're putting out into the world. But there's something in them, something powerful that took hold when they were touched by the powers beyond, a thing that goes far beyond just stage names, something godlike. So, thusly, Scratch has been manifested by an intense concentration of negative thoughts in the normal world about Alan, and now Scratch seeks to destroy his reputation back home and do God knows what to Alice. So in order to defeat Scratch, Alan revises an old Night Springs episode script he wrote years ago, Rod Serling narrator and all. The story is about a champion of light who seeks to defeat his dark doppelganger, <laughs> which is very appropriate. Alan sets this show down in the fictional town of Night Springs, then places Night Springs inside of Arizona, which appears to be a place where there's sort of a thin membrane between the real world and the dark place, resulting in three women being pulled from Arizona into the dark place. Mechanic Emma Sloan, Selena Valdivia, and scientist Dr. Meadows. I find it interesting that all the people Alan interacts with in Night Springs are women, specifically damsels in distress. Emma's an accommodating, self-sufficient woman who's taken a lot of shit for being a female in the mechanic field. Selena's touched by the dark place to be super horny for scratch and by proxy Alan, which kind of reminds me of the gratuitous butt shot of Alan from earlier. And Dr. Meadows is a very self-aware, no BS, emotionally intelligent woman who makes Alan own up to the consequences of his reality warping powers. But this idea that you're somehow altering reality with your writing is ridiculous. You're essentially saying you're controlling my actions. Leaving aside the rational arguments against this, what gives you the right? I feel like all of these women represent an aspect of Alice that Alan either misses or admires, from her sexual embrace to her nurturing nature to her keeping him honest when he's on some shit. Even in his imagination, he can't help but emanate a very specific kind of need for her very specific kind of love. In fact, two manuscript pages show that Alan is growing as a person and that he truly loves Alice in spite of his bad tendencies and wants to be good for her back in the real world. She took all the stupid, self-indulgent bullshit I brought into her life and still stood by me. Still loved me. It's no betrayal. But I'm a better person now than I used to be. I want to be that person with her. So, while his motivation is clear, how he's to defeat Scratch is not. When Alan arrives, Scratch opens a portal near an oil derrick where Taken keep flooding into the world, and in order to stop this, the scene has to be set in a very specific way. Alan gets a manuscript page from Emma with some clues as to what events and items need to be in what configuration, and a signal from the satellite overhead seems to be providing small tidbits at a time. But every time Alan fails to find the proper order of things and tries to approach Scratch the drive through theater too soon, the women are killed by the darkness and the scene resets, wiping his progress but leaving the women with some strange memory of what happened before. Oh hell, this isn't going right! On the third try, Alan manages to get the full radio transmission recorded that tells him all the details. An interesting tidbit since Thomas Zane in the writer DLC said that the only way to reach the normal world was through dreams and radio signals, which might explain how Alan is able to send himself TV messages forward into the future about his time in the cabin writing departure, or how Scratch is able to send those taunting messages through the TVs in American Nightmare. American Nightmare. 
But once Alan's able to set the scene and crash the satellite into the oil derrick and stop the influx of dark energy, he does the same to the movie projector room too, so that it projects a movie onto the screen so bright that it emulates Scratch in a matter of seconds. You can't do this! All I did was take the things you always wanted and never had the balls to go for! It's my turn now! It's my life! Yeah, take that, bitch. <laughs> the movie behind his fading particles shows Alan on a beach somewhere, and Alice slowly comes up to him, almost disbelieving that it's really him. Alan? Is it... is it really you? They passionately embrace, together, at last. But the narrator pulls back on accepting this too literally, asking, Are these actual events, or merely a dream? A memory, or a glimpse of what is to come? To which I answer, why not all of these? I think this all happened, I just don't think that Alice in this game is the real Alice, but a manifestation of Alan's desire to see her again, as Alice is already free from the dark place and is back in our world. But then again, it could be some future event being broadcast to Barry's brain too, since his viewpoint, or his dream, is the frame. There's even a great little moment at the end when the TV in Barry's room that was playing American Nightmare goes to static. Man, I hope we get to see Barry again and he gets some relief, as I'd hate to see this glimmer of hope get snuffed out. But if nothing else, Nightmare's existence is justified by just being a fun game whose manuscript pages do a great job of advancing our understanding of the world's rules, even if the story proper is a little murky. Fair enough. And with that, we arrive at the next chapters of Alan's saga, Quantum Break and Control. Now you may be thinking, Sam Lake already said Quantum Break and Max Payne weren't part of the Remedy Connected Universe, and you'd be technically correct. Technically correct. The best kind of correct. Microsoft still owns the IP, so Remedy by default can't use anything from Quantum Break, nor can they use Max Payne as he's owned by Rockstar. But as we'll find out, Remedy seems to be backdooring trademark-friendly versions of characters from Max Payne and Quantum Break into Alan Wake 2 in ways that show that Remedy is intending the most meta way of going around copyright infringement while still getting to eat their cake too. So let's check out first how Quantum Break illuminates Alan's story. First, here's a little bit about Quantum Break's story for those unfamiliar or who need a refresher. Jack Joyce comes back to Riverport to meet his old friend Paul Serene, who's invented a time machine. Unfortunately, something malfunctions, damaging the time-space continuum so much that time itself starts collapsing, but not before bathing Jack and Serene in chronon radiation so that they gain time-related superpowers. Serene goes mad with this power, as he can see possible futures and decide how he wants to make decisions in the present. And despite the game's insistence that time cannot be changed, Serene keeps forcing the issue, having allied himself with the evil corporation Monarch Solutions, who want the power of the time machine for themselves. Interestingly, Monarch CEO Martin Hatch seems interested in the time machine as a means to another end entirely. Little is known about his past or true intentions, though, except that he's a shifter, meaning someone exposed to chronon radiation who can shift between all of their different selves in each possible timeline at once, and is almost impossible to kill as a result. It's these mysterious and implacable odds that Jack and a monarch defector named Beth Wilder must overcome in order to repair time and save our very existence. So, what does all this have to do with Alan Wake? Well, for starters, notice the name Riverport, where Quantum Break takes place, as well as Beth Wilder and Paul Serene's last names, Wilder and Serene. We've heard these words before in Thomas Zane's poem that the Bright Presence recited in Alan's dream. For he did not know that beyond the lake he called home lies a deeper, darker ocean green, where waves are both wilder and more serene. To its ports I've been. So, ports I've been, as in river port, and river as in lake, as in an ocean where the waves are both wilder, or Beth Wilder, and more serene, or more Paul serene? Interesting. So is this fun wordplay for attentive fans, or something more? I'm inclined to think it's more based on how much Remedy is trying to incorporate Max Payne and elements of Quantum Break in Alan Wake 2 under different names and forms. 
After all, an early prototype of what 2 would be and what it actually still looks like is consistent with the return trailer that plays on a TV outside of the university in Quantum Break's opening. We see two FBI agents looking into the Alan Wake case, one of which is an unknown blonde woman but was supposedly called Saga Anderson even back then if you zoom in on her badge. The other is obviously played by Sam Lake and is Alex Casey, a very on-the-nose meta-reference to how Sam Lake provided the likeness for Max Payne. They get on the trail of Alan and think they've found him, but it appears they've run into Mr. Scratch, as he's much more violent and bloodthirsty, and even looks to kill Casey when he gets too close. Casey's picture goes up on the evidence board as a victim with the trademark constipated Max Payne expression, and the hunt continues with Saga all by herself. Now, what's unclear is what type of media this is being advertised as. I'm guessing it's a movie trailer, as Alan Wake appears to be a fictional book or movie character in Quantum Break's universe, as evidenced by the blackboard inside the university that applies storytelling criticism techniques to the story we've played through in the main game. Approaching the story this way lets Remedy cheat in some context clues and authorial intent that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. So let's go over the notes on the blackboard in no particular order. For starters, the blackboard notes that Alice Wake's role is as fickle muse who can live without Alan, but he can't live without her. There's even a suspicion that Alan might be crazy and actually murdered her, which brings us to Mr. Scratch, the urban legend come alive. Mr. Scratch is noted as being like Old Scratch, a common nickname in Americana for the devil, as well as looking like the Norse word scrot, meaning demon. Scratch is called Alan's dark side who wears his face while Alan's in the dark place. Scratch also represents the brutal, hateful editor slash critic who defiles the artist's words. As Alan says in American Nightmare, his advantage is that Scratch is not a creator, but he is. AWE, the abbreviation we saw in the agent's jacket in Samantha Wells' dream from earlier, is trotted out as possibly standing for the Alan Wake experience or altered world events, which is what it would eventually become in control. The dark presence and dark place are likened to the dark matter that supposedly makes up 95% of our universe. Thomas Sane's notes in This House of Dreams indicate that the dark place is likely the same as the void that existed before the creation of the universe, and that it may actually envelop or exceed our dimension in size. Its seemingly eternal depths are represented by a spiral. In Control's AWE DLC, Jessie enters the Ocean View Hotel, which is a nexus of various worlds, and in it she opens a door with a spiral on it to see a vision of Alan Wake. Not only that, but Thomas Sane's line about the dark place being an ocean, not a lake, is equated with the endless night term from poet William Blake's Auguries of Innocence. Cooler yet, we get to see that Barbara Jagger, often called the scratching hag from Bright Falls and blamed for children's disappearances, has a name meant to sound like the famous witch Baba Yaga. Barbara Jagger, Baba Yaga. And the bird leg cabin is meant to remind us of the chicken leg hut that the Baba Yaga travels in. We even get to see the million dollar question regarding Thomas Zane and Alan Wake as it relates to the page in the shoebox describing a seven year old Alan with the clicker. And that question is, who created who? Or is that who created whom? <laughs> The blackboard asks if this is an eternal closed loop, an Ouroboros. We'll get into this term more in my Signalis video when we discuss eternal recurrence, but the Ouroboros is a serpent that eats its own tail, a symbol of the eternal cycle of life, death, and rebirth. More importantly to Alan Wake, it represents a self-perpetuating, self-fulfilling paradox. This cyclical nature might also be referenced in Zane's note we just referenced from This House of Dreams. It's not a lake, it's an ocean, darkness before the act of creation, before the Big Bang, darkness upon the face of the deep, upon the face of the waters, before light, before the primeval atom, before the word, before the poem. I could be a creator, the creator. It has happened before, and it will happen again, many times. This points me directly towards the lyrics of the old Gods of Asgard song Balance Slays the Demon from American Nightmare, which has a hidden message that, when played backwards, says it will happen again in another town, a town called Ordinary. <laughs> Ordinary was not only the town where Samantha Wells from this house of dreams lived, but where Jesse Faden was born and where she encountered the magical slide projector that opened other dimensions and gifted her with a familiar called Polaris that would eventually guide her to the oldest house, which is a neat little parallel. We get one more weird little note about Christmas lights, which I assume is meaning the ones that Barry wrapped himself in. It even intimates that these are supposed to reference Christmas itself and the birth of a savior, which is not something that scene will make you think of, but something that is clearly on the minds of Sam Lake and company. I'd be interested to see where this goes, um, as I'm not sure anything in the game so far has given any context for this theory. Is the savior Alan? And if so, why focus on his birth? 
We've only so far seen a young Alan playing with the clicker and noted that his mother said it belonged to his father that he never knew. Now, I've been agonizing on where to bring up a certain theory about Alan and Thomas Zane that I find really interesting, and I think this is a really good place to do it. The theory goes that Thomas Zane is Alan Wake's long-lost father that he never knew, and that their resemblance is why the Anderson brothers keep calling Alan Tom. It might also justify why there's a rocking horse present in Birdleg Cabin, which has no reason to be there unless it belonged to a child of Thomas and Barbara's. Notably, the same rocking horse shows up in American Nightmare in the pathway leading out from the starting area, which seems very strange to be here in the dark place, unless it's a symbol associated with Alan. Did Thomas Zane, when trying to write himself out of existence, wipe himself away from Alan's life as his father so that he never knew him? If true, the fact that Zane is essentially handing down a family heirloom through the bright presence means the shoebox page about the clicker is even more meaningful than it first seemed. It's a fascinating theory, and the fact that Remy saw fit to put the who created who question on the blackboard as if to call special attention to this quandary seems almost too significant to mean nothing. But I guess we'll find out soon enough in the sequel. Lastly on the blackboard, we see the three stages of departure, initiation, and return as put forth by Joseph Campbell's monomyth or hero's journey. In the House of Dreams notes, the author of a title page has been scratched out, and below are these three stages, possibly a reference to Mr. Scratch. As for the stages themselves, departure is when the hero leaves behind what he knows and steps out on an adventure that changes his life forever. Initiation is when the hero meets a helper or a mentor, like the Bright Presence, and faces trials and temptations. And return is when the hero returns to their original home with the competencies they've acquired in their journey and effect a healing and positive change in their original community. Obviously, two of these stages are the names of manuscripts that Alan's written or writing now. Even the blackboard calls attention to the strangeness of this disorder by putting a question mark over the missing initiation stage, which I think could be an actual plot point in Alan Wake 2. It seems very likely that he's possibly not following the hero's journey properly, hence why he's having so much trouble getting out. I'm glad to see this kind of thematic transparency about what Alan Wake is going for. He's trying to follow the rules of storytelling as we've known it for all of humanity's existence, and hopes that he can use the power of belief and craftsmanship to escape a world where every word can mean damnation or deliverance. And speaking about archetypes, that's the perfect segue into Control, which ostensibly has very little but also everything to do with Alan Wake. Did I lose you there for a moment? You know what's on my mind. It'll probably be a while before I formally review this one, but I figured I'd give you my thoughts on it since I did like a lot of the game. The weak ending, frustrating difficulty, and shoehorn looting is all that kept this game from being my favorite of 2019, second only to the other game about a redheaded older sister who saves her brother with superpowers in Plague Tale Innocence. Controls set up like a Souls game, with respawning enemies and checkpoints spread around an increasingly interconnected oldest house that's full of haunting lore and huge bosses to contend with. Its loot and upgrade system is fairly tedious and uninspired, and combat can be kind of messy, but you'd be hard-pressed to find a game with better particle effects or immersive level and sound design. It just makes you feel gloriously infinitesimal in comparison to the cavernous hallways and Lovecraftian horrors. You'd also be hard-pressed to find better superhero games out there right now, because once Jessie gets her guns, telekinesis, mind control, and flight abilities all going at once, it's quite a rush. But you didn't really come here to figure out how it plays, because we're really here just to get the deets on Alan Wake, aren't we? The story begins with Jesse Faden finding the oldest house after 17 years of searching for her long-lost brother Dylan, who was taken here as a child. In their childhood, Jesse and Dylan stumbled upon a magical slide projector that could open other dimensions, and even bestowed upon them an invisible telepathic being called Polaris that they carry with them, and which finally guided Jesse here. Jesse manages to flee the FBC, but they take Dylan away to the oldest house, a shifting skyscraper where supernatural phenomena called altered world events are studied and contained, including the Bright Falls WE involving Cauldron Lake and Alan Wake. There, Jesse meets a helpful old janitor named Otti, who's curiously named after a Finnish sea god, and who even later claims that the old gods of Asgard are friends of his. Hmm. After getting some help from Otti to progress deeper into the oldest house, Jesse discovers the previous director, Zachariah Trench, has killed himself under the influence of the otherworldly Hiss, beings who were let into the old house when Trench used the very slide projector that gifted Jesse and Dylan with Polaris. The hiss infect and corrupt everything they touch, much like the Dark Presence did, indicating some possible similitude in their makeup. Jessie has to stop this invasion and find her brother. 
She finds the tools she needs in a shape-shifting service weapon that is an object of power. Items that can be as mundane as a rubber ducky or a refrigerator, but have been empowered with a connection to the astral plane through the collective unconscious. We find out that the clicker and Alan's typewriter are considered to be such items due to their contact with otherworldly forces like the Dark Presence, but also how Zane and Alan have written about them using the Presence's power and essentially charged them up with meaning energy. Most interesting of all, coming into contact with an object of power will transport you to the astral plane where the board resides. Like Polaris, the board is a bodiless, alien life form that communicates through resonance, which is when something is vibrated upon by something sharing its same frequency, and it has communicated thusly with the FBC directors for some time now, essentially calling the shots like a theocracy. But as Jessie searches for her brother and tries to stop the hiss infection, she finds that the board is not nearly as benevolent as they seem, and that they may be exploiting the FBC and the oldest house's access to other dimensions for nefarious ends. So, what does all this have to do with Alan Wake? Well, inside the main campaign, Jesse finally finds Dylan, and he's been overtaken by the hiss, but somehow retained his sanity, and he relates many different dreams he's had while being infected. In one dream, Dylan was back in ordinary, but he was a girl with the name Jesse Dylan Faden. In another dream, Dylan was going to be the director instead of Jesse, but he got Jesse a job doing menial tasks like making coffee and delivering mail, but then somehow it became apparent that they were in a boring, never-ending video game, which is a meta-reference to the game's fake-out ending where Jesse gets momentarily infected by the hiss before breaking free. Another dream cast the game's story as a musical about the idea of an ordinary story about an ordinary girl from an ordinary town. This is an ordinary song about an ordinary girl from an ordinary town. It's the ordinary story. In another, he's remote viewing this very conversation with Jesse in real time. In another, the hiss break free of the oldest house and take over the world. Dylan notes that the dreams have started to feel more and more real. And then he tells us one very, very important dream that he had. I was in a dark place. And there was a dark man there. His name was Mr. Door. And he told me that there are many worlds side by side on top of each other, some inside of others. In one world, there was a writer who wrote a story about a cop. In another world, the cop was real. Dor said he himself was in all of them at the same time, endlessly shifting between them. I asked him how I could reach these worlds. I wanted to bring the hiss there. But he didn't want to help me. He didn't like the idea. What did he know? I'm not wild about the idea myself. So Dylan was in the dark place and was approached by a dark man named Mr. Door who was present in all realities at once and could shift between all of them. Does that sound familiar? These physical characteristics, along with the fact that Hatch is a shifter and Mr. Door shifts between realities, seems to indicate that Remedy wants to make very clear who Mr. Door is meant to be, a Martin Hatch stand-in. Mr. Door tells Dylan that we are essentially in a heterotopia, a concept popularized by philosopher Michael Foucault that describes worlds within worlds, all different, yet similar enough that their contrasts grant insight. In one of these worlds, we see a writer that is obviously Alan Wake writing about a cop that is obviously Alex Casey, and in another world, this cop is actually a real person, not a fictional character. We even find out later that an FBI agent named Alex Casey has made an inquiry into Alan Wake's disappearance, a rather mind-blowing detail. Was he made real by the dark place as Mr. Scratch was, or has somehow another reality crashed into the one we've come to know in the world of Alan Wake and Control? As Alex Casey plays very heavily into Alan Wake 2, I guess we'll have to wait to find out. But while these revelations are pretty sweet in getting us ready for Alan Wake 2, we still have various Bright Falls related documents and the AWE DLC for Control to go over. Alice Wake was retrieved by the FBC during their investigation into the Bright Falls AWE and was treated for her trauma there. Alan was notably listed as a para-utilitarian, and possibly even a future director based on his ability to rewrite reality. A para-utilitarian is someone who wields paranatural powers often associated with an object of power they're bound with, like Alan's clicker, typewriter, or Jesse's service weapon. Notably, Clay Stewart, whom you'll remember from earlier as the author of the Alan Wake files that had shared dreams with Alan, is listed as having minor para-utilitarian sensitivity. So clearly, not all powers are related to the dark place specifically, but may originate from similar dimensions like the astral plane or contact with entities like Polaris, the Hiss, or the Dark Presence. 
I think Alan's writing ability actually was paranatural by itself, and that the dark presence and dark place merely allowed his inherent abilities extra powers to manifest what he could always see. Hear me out. As the bomb-ass Redditor Critical Punch put forth, Alan is likely clairvoyant, which means someone that can see both the future and the past. Likewise, so is Clay Stewart, Jake Fisher with his Deerhead vision, and the Anderson brothers. Alan and Clay have a shared dream that gives them insight into either a possible future or the future, and if you'll remember, one of the first manuscript pages said, The book I couldn't remember was either a terrible and true prophecy, or an act of creation that had rewritten the world. Again, why not both? Additionally, the Anderson Brothers' song catalog, like The Poet and the Muse, perfectly describes the past events of Thomas Zane and Barbara Jagger's lives that actually happened a year before in 1970, before they were ever a band in 1971. Now, whether they had this ability or not before they start making moonshine and drinking cauldron lake water, I couldn't tell you, but either way, they're the instruments that allow for this transmission of otherwise inaccessible information. Similarly, Alan's writing about Alex Casey may not actually be fiction, but sight into another reality where he does exist, another world on top or parallel to Alan's, much like how Mr. Dorr describes it. And there were visions that I knew were not real, ideas I had lost, often of Casey. I had written about him for years. I used them as well. The lies had to feel true for them to become true. Had I always written this way? Even before, seen things without realizing I was seeing them, thinking they were mine. Was this what inspiration was for me? Dylan Faden's ability to see into other worlds that we know exist, like Alan as a writer or Case existing as a real cop, indicate that a large part of contact with the otherworldly beings of the connected universe means having a second sight that can see in any direction at once, across time and space, much like Quantum Break wanted us to start thinking about. But Alan's not just able to see possible futures and past in the dark place, but can use the dark place to nudge reality into his preferred direction as long as he reaches a critical mass of earned drama. Zane tried to force things through, to resurrect someone from the dead, and it only empowered the Dark Presence further, so clearly, artists there can't just write anything they want into place. Although, of course, sometimes the game kind of cheats, where side characters can get murdered right and left, and somehow that doesn't break the balance. So, the rules are in place and Alan's operating within them in control, but what is he actually up to? Well, he appears to be making another attempt to escape the Dark Place, and he's chosen Jesse and the oldest house's occupants to write about this time. There's a common misconception that he created everything in control, or at least most of it, and I'll be honest, that's the impression that I got in my first playthrough. But like we just said, the Dark Place doesn't just let you force entire people into existence or events together at will. Admittedly, from a theoretical standpoint, I'm still not sure how Alan plans to use Jesse to help him, nor how he knows about any of them in the first place, but judging by some Night Springs episode scripts that almost verbatim repeat what happened with the Hiss invasion here, it's likely Alan simply was transcribing another glimpse into the future, not writing it into reality from scratch, as he wouldn't have had that power until being inside the dark place decades after he wrote this script. Evidence that Alan can see into this part of reality is that he's aware of the existence of Polaris, and that she will be able to help Jesse sense the psychic distress call he's sending her, and as we know, radio signals and the like are one of the few ways to reach outside the dark place. Faden was sensitive to visitations. She had them all the time. From her guiding star, she was the perfect receiver. Her guide felt it too. Polaris didn't flare up in defense as with the hiss, so it wasn't all bad. It'd be quite the contrivance if Alan could just write Polaris' abilities into existence, so clearly he's operating under the assumption that these things exist and will be useful to his story's efficacy. Jesse follows his distress call all the way into the Ocean View Motel, which is a nexus of realities, so to speak, where each door opens into another dimension, one of which has the spiral we saw in Quantum Break's blackboard that's associated with the Dark Place. Behind it, Jesse experiences a vision of Alan confusedly muttering to himself as if recovering from some kind of memory loss, possibly something similar to how the three women's memories were affected when the time loop reset in American Nightmare. A man who looks just like Alan appears to him, and Alan asks this man to identify himself, and he calls himself Alan's old friend Tom Zane. When Alan balks at this answer, saying he looks different and not like the diver he knows, Tom brushes this off, saying that that was just a form he took of an old character in a film he made once, noting that he's a filmmaker, not a poet as Alan knew him. Tom tries to reassure Alan that they're buddies, saying that they're collaborating at this point, and that Alan's found a way to escape, and it'll work this time. He even offers Alan a drink, which seems ominous considering Alan's known alcohol problems. 
Alan chokes on the drink, disbelieving of Tom's words, and he asks him if he knows about his double who's still out there, assumedly referencing Mr. Scratch. Tom seems unperturbed by this question, saying he's dealing with him, which drives Alan into a rage as he seems surprised Zane's made contact with Scratch without telling him. The scene ends with them arguing. This is a confusing-ass scene for anyone who was expecting something a little more concrete to go on, since we hadn't seen our boy in seven years at this point. It's also disconcerting because Tom Zane's no longer voiced by James McCaffrey, but Alan's mocap actor Ilka Billy, probably because he was already voicing Zachariah Trench and would be voicing Alex Casey in future projects. So not only is his voice different, but his personality is snarky and guileful, not wise and helpful like the Bright Presence was the last time it wore Tom Zane's body. Many have speculated that this isn't really Tom Zane or the Bright Presence, but Mr. Scratch trying to mess with him, which would account for the personality change, how he encourages Alan to partake in a vice, and the fact that he's ironically Alan's exact double as Alan complains about how his double is out there on the loose. Jesse has a very interesting reaction to seeing this vision, recognizing both Wake and Zane. And Thomas Zane was with him. The poet. No, wait. D -d -d he was a filmmaker. I... <laughs> I always remember that wrong. Now this is a weird detail, because in a recorded psychotherapy session, a young Jessie calls Zane her favorite poet. You mentioned a poem last time we talked. By Thomas Zane? Yes. Beyond the shadow you settle for, there's a miracle illuminated. Hmm. I looked the poem up. Only I couldn't find any poet by that name. I did find a European filmmaker who moved here in the 60s, named Thomas Zane. What? Which makes sense if we remember that Zane tried to write himself out of existence. But if Zane is now calling himself a filmmaker, or Zane, as the bright presence is wearing him, calls himself a filmmaker and not a poet, then how does Jesse remember not only his poet profession, but also his work, which we've seen evidence of in the shoebox that Samantha Wells from This House of Dreams discovered? Is it possible that Jesse is easily confusing these two professions because her mind is struggling to keep the story straight, as Zane or the Dark Place or whoever are rewriting reality and changing the details of the past? In American Nightmare, we read that The reality we take for granted is softer, more adaptable than we think. Under correct conditions, you can reshape it. Turn it into almost anything you want. When it happens, almost nobody notices. It's not that we forget. It's that after the change, there's nothing to remember. Only those who have been directly touched by the powers that can shift reality are aware of the changes. So maybe this is Jesse's paranatural sensitivity that Polaris grants her taking over and giving her some sort of awkward, not quite aware, but just aware enough to know that something's off and something's a little strange. To make matters even more confusing, a poster in Alan Wake 2's promo footage talks about a filmmaker named Thomas Zane, formerly Finnish artist Thomas Zane, who used to play his own doppelganger in his various works. Man, Remedy just could not leave well enough alone with this guy. Just let the guy live in the baby universe with his babs, jags, and peace. Once again, Remedy proves that Thomas Zane is probably the most inscrutable and interesting character that has still got plenty more layers to uncover, so I guess we'll get to that when we get to it. What I will say is extra tantalizing, as far as theory crafting goes, is noting that this is the only time Zane has ever shown looking just like Alan. Remember how the Anderson brothers twice called Alan by the name Tom and even once as Zane? Is that they were easy to confuse? Is that they looked alike? I don't know what this means, but the fact that Dylan had a weird dream about a reality where he and Jesse were one person with both their names makes me wonder if there's some strange Jungian psychology going on here. Let's not forget that weird scene at the end of Control where Jesse is trying to resist the hiss and starts speaking to herself as someone the subtitles calls Jesse Polaris, who says, Grow brighter. Around one constant they revolve. What do you bet that this is talking about how each version of someone we see in the connected universe is actually a reflection of an ideal being, or a concept of a being, one constant around which all the different timelines or realities orbit as slightly different variations of this idealized version of something? It would line up perfectly with the collective unconscious idea, which is all about archetypes and idealized versions of things and people. Not gonna lie, I just ran into this idea and it's blowing my mind at the back of my head. So, while I can't really wrap my head around it just yet, it is fun to think about. Just give me credit if this shows up in Alan Wake 2, okay? 
So yeah, that's the mountain of implication from just one very confusing conversation between Alan and the maybe kind of sort of Tom Zane. Once back in the oldest house, Jesse's informed that a certain Dr. Hartman we all know and hate has turned himself into a Taken by jumping into Cauldron Lake. So the FBC apprehended him, but then he was driven cuckoo for Cocoa Puss when he sensed Alan through the presence of Alice Wake in the same sector, who had been brought in for questioning about the Bright Falls AWE. Turns out, Alan's been orchestrating this and other parts of the control narrative. He came up with the chant that the Hiss say, which is said to be nonsense that it is an alien trying to mimic human intelligence, but because Remedy doesn't seem to do much accidentally, I'd imagine there's hidden messages all in this thing. Regardless, Alan's got some hand in how the Hiss operate, and he's used Alice's presence here as bait, using his connection to her to justify her inclusion in the story, of course, making sure to get her out of here just in time to keep her safe, but this means that Hartman breaks out of containment and then gets infected by the hiss, becoming a third type of thingy, a human hiss taken monstrosity. Alan's plan was to work within the connections he had, you know, his wife, his old involuntary therapist, and to use them as details to create a conflict that Jesse would have to respond to, as he's looking for a hero to come save him, as he can't just stand and wait. A big part of the initiation ritual in Joseph Campbell's monomyth is that the hero gets help from an outside source, and this appears to be a similar endeavor. Jesse obliges, ending Hartman's wretched existence. Then, a transmission shows up that shows that there's an AWE happening in Bright Falls again, only the date is supposedly years in the future, as if referencing the events of Alan Wake 2 as they occur in the year of our Lord 2023. So this is pretty cool stuff. And that's the whole of Alan Wake's story so far. He's defeated the Dark Presence, is now trapped in the Dark Place, and has attempted to get Jesse Faden and possibly the FBC at her disposal. It's unclear whether this was just a shot in the dark that may not pan out, as Saga Anderson, the blonde woman in the Quantum Break trailer that's now been obviously recast in Alan Wake 2, is supposedly going to play the part in rescuing him. But who knows how successful his endeavors will be, whether all of this will be worth it in the end, or whether it will simply consume him. But before we get into Alan Wake 2 predictions and expectations, I did want to take a brief moment to go over what Alan Wake means to me personally and what it can teach us all as a metaphor about the creative process. So, I went to college to become a creative writer making novels and short stories, but as my senior year hit, I got lackadaisical and every notable writing mentor had left the school by then, meaning I'd lost some of the fire and there wasn't much guidance to take me to the next level anyway. I wrote next to nothing for almost 10 years after college, when, at the urging of my wife, I started a video game review blog called HighFunctioningMedium.com in late 2019. And as you can imagine, when 2020 hit, I had quite a lot of time to write, and so I did. Now, as much fun as this was, I realized that video reviews were much more profitable, so even though I hadn't liked video editing in college, I bit the bullet, started my own YouTube channel, and I've never looked back. I always had to remember, though, that the cost of starting again was always going to be enduring failures. And even more importantly, I needed to treat my wife and those around me with care, not getting caught up in my new aspiring career as an internet talking head, who assumes people have nothing better to do than watch me rant. Now, like Alan Wake, I've been abrasive, short, self-centered, rash, and unpleasant when I'm working on a project, acting as if I'm the most interesting man on the planet who has to believe he's making the most interesting thing, or he'll crumble into a million needy artist pieces. I've also had fears that resurrecting my dead dream of making it as a writer meant that I had to prepare for my greatest fear, which was not failure, but getting the success I wanted and it not being nearly enough. Alan Wake's journey mirrors this dilemma. By all accounts, Alan Wake is a popular writer, but he does seem to be a genre fiction writer of horror and crime, not necessarily a savant whose work will be studied in literature classes for generations to come. And considering that it's likely that the visions he's had are of approximately true things, like the Hiss Invasion and the Federal Bureau of Night Springs episode script, or Alex Casey and all the rest, it's possible that Remedy is implying that his writer's block is indicative of his creative corruption, his lazy transcription of other people's lives running its course. He needs to branch out. And once Alan finally gets the power to make something important in his life besides just conventional blockbuster schlock, the stakes couldn't be higher, testing his resolve and whether he really has it in him to be a better writer and a better person. And winning against the dark place may corrupt him so much that he's not himself once he's done. I know I have that fear all the time of becoming like some prick celebrity drunk on fame or becoming so jaded about the creative process I don't love it like I used to. And then what do I have? What am I? 
So like me and many other aspiring artists, our hero's journey, if you will, involves casting off main character syndrome and not treating your own spouse and friends like supporting characters in your story. Alan Wake had to learn this, and so did Clay Stewart, our tortured dreamer from earlier. His wife and child left him when he became obsessed with finding answers to his dreams. Clay's afterward to the Alan Wake files explains how men especially love to escape their responsibilities by putting themselves on grand quests, which is something I've done and many artists tend to do. His account reads as such. The preceding investigation was conducted at great personal cost. The night I discovered Bright Falls, I left my wife Anna and our newborn son Milo on a quest for a man who had appeared to me in a series of dreams. Anna never understood the importance of my visions, never appreciated that they had a significance that extended upon our petty lives into the world beyond. Sometimes it felt as though she couldn't see anything beyond the laundry, the bills, the local news. I will admit that she considered my investigation to be, at best, the product of obsession, and at worst, a convenient way by which I could avoid the burdens of fatherhood. In the interest of full disclosure, I will admit also that since I lost my job, I have not been able to provide for my family in any meaningful sense. Anna and I were once in love, but we married young. I was 20, she was 19, and since our wedding day, I had felt more and more estranged from her. I had become depressed, and I wasn't much use around the house. Milo cried. He cried a lot. I would pick him up and try to play father, but he would still scream and bawl till I could hardly stand it. There's truth to what she said, but there's truth to what I found. When I left for Bright Falls that night, I kissed my wife and boy for what I thought might be the last time, convinced that if I found what had appeared to me in my visions, then I would perish the way I had each night for months. Anna told me that if I returned, she and Milo would be gone, and that I wouldn't be able to find them, that it was over between us. She begged me to stay, and as I walked out the door, she wished me dead. Stewart's search eventually does run dry, and he throws his dream journals into Cauldron Lake in hopes of returning these evil visions to their source. He returns home and eventually reconciles with his wife and child. Now, he's awash in the light and warmth of a thousand suns, and has treasures beyond their imagining, because he's untouchable and alive as he now walks in the light. For now, Alan can only dream of such an outcome, but this is perhaps the privilege of those not called to be the hero. Clay, for all his suffering, is burdened with ostensibly less power than Alan, and any Spider-Man fan knows that what comes with great power. Clay's been noted by the FBC to only have a minor para-utilitarian capability, while Alan's even been considered for directorship like Jesse and Dylan were due to his prowess. The height of Alan's abilities almost forces him into the destiny of martyr, trading his life away for his wife's and so many others who could have died had the Dark Presence escaped. Even nine years into his exile here, he's still forgetting what's happened, still struggling to find a way out. As the Alan Wake files say, while the subject matter changed, Wake's fiction itself remains charged by his own unique psyche and the doubts and fears he contends with. Wake could not escape himself through fiction. If anything, his fiction reflected a deeper version of himself. As Alan Wake 2's marketing suggests, the Dark Place is indeed feeding off of his memories and constructing the world around him in response to who he is at his core, so in order to become a hero, he has to defeat his own dark side, Mr. Scratch. Let's also not forget that the last we heard of Scratch and Alice was in the Control AWE DLC, as we find FBC interviews with Alice where Scratch has been tormenting her with horrifying visitations. For me as a player, this shit just got personal. And you know how Alan reacts when people threaten his wife. My clinic is a place where... Oh, hey! Oh, my! She's gonna suffer bad. You touch her all. God only knows what else Remini has in store for him. Nice set you got here. Really quickly before I go, though, I would like to give you some impressions hopes, and fears about what Remedy has in store for him in Alan Wake 2. Now, it's clear that Control was a major stylistic turning point for Remedy, as title screens have that wonderful, sonorous pop-up feature still, and the camera seems much wider, more epic than before. There's a lot of weird imagery and bold colors like Control, and Remedy's really leaning into the Resident Evil formula, specifically Resident Evil 2 Remake. Emulating Resident Evil 2 Remake is a genius place to start this sequel off, as that's legitimately one of the best games I have ever played. And Remedy just continues to show us that they're one of the most passionate developers out there that can make games with panache, production value, and style in a way that you just don't see that much anymore. The inclusion of a Martin Hatch knockoff in Mr. Door to a clear Max Payne stand-in with Alex Casey, who's played by Sam Lake and voiced by James McCaffrey just like the original, is just so cool from a fan perspective. 
think this game is just going to be an absolute treat for the well-informed and attentive Alan Wake fan. It's just so wonderful that Remedy is essentially making the ultimate follow-up to every one of their games and bringing back all the old actors in similar roles. I think we're going to be in for quite a treat. I know I just about get emotional seeing so many of my favorite things coming together in ways that just feels like Remedy exploding into their final form. So, I hope I got you ready for Alan Wake 2 with this overly long foray into one of my favorite franchises ever, and I hope you have a great time playing these games if you haven't already, or have a good time replaying them to get ready for 2. And don't you worry, I love Alan Wake way too much not to give you a full-on review once I've finished the sequel, so be on the lookout for that too. Also be looking out for Signalis in probably early 2024, as I've wrapped the voiceover editing for that, but I'm now in the proper editing stages once I'm done with this video. I'll also be trying to cram in a missed retrospective to celebrate its 30th anniversary at the end of this year, probably sometime around Christmas. Busy times here at High Stress Medium. I mean, <laughs> High Functioning Medium. <laughs> I'm totally doing okay. <laughs> Don't worry about me. Don't. Save me. Save me. Help! I want to give an extra special little shout out to the Reddit theorists and Control and Alan Wake subreddits, because these guys have really enriched my experience of these games with their creativity and perception. And a really big thank you to the Remedy Discord for helping with prompt responses to burning questions that I had, including some help from Matt of Hidden Machine, whom many of you probably know. Thanks again, everyone. You're one of my favorite communities I've ever encountered while making a project. It's been a pleasure. Now, I also want to give a huge shout out to my lovely patrons, Mark Neubauer, Dead Forge, Shantiva, Hey Blondie, James Wyatt, The Nth Review, and Yaxo. You guys have given me such great encouragement and support, and it's just really helped me inch towards this being a full-time thing one day. And as a thank you, I'd like to provide a long time coming answer to a question that Dead Forge asked on the Patreon a long time ago. What is the thing that inspires you the most in what you do on YouTube, and how has making videos on what you love made an impact in your life? Well, this video and my upcoming Signalis video are great examples of why I do this. In Alan Wake's case, I can't get enough of its lore, and I really use this as an opportunity to level up my understanding of the game's world, and hopefully simultaneously make that a useful resource for you. In Signalis's case, I did something similar, but much more esoteric and theoretical. It was truly exhausting, as I'm only done with the script and have yet to edit, and it's been several months. But it has helped me reconcile with what I found to be a truly challenging and sometimes frustrating game to like. But contending with your own shortcomings and trying to meet art halfway can make you much less vindictive towards things you don't like immediately or ever, and more understanding of why you don't. And that's healing, that's enlightening, and enriching overall. So that's what I get out of researching and experiencing art, and I hope that translates. And like I said before, if you've been enjoying the channel and or this video felt like something you'd like to see more of, please consider helping the channel grow by becoming a YouTube channel member and you can become a patron at Patreon forward slash high functioning medium. Now, if you're looking for ways to support the channel that don't actually cost you anything, feel free to use my GOG and NordVPN affiliate links. It sends me a little chunk of the sale at no extra cost to you. And like I said before, any and all support is invaluable, even if it's just watching the video. So thanks in advance for any of that that you may do and for taking the time to watch this one. You're a really big encouragement. I am glad to hear that. Now, one thing I've always wanted to do with the Patreon is make it more than just a place for you to put your money in a coffer and say, do with it what you will, but to be a starting place for collaboration so that you, the viewer and producer of this this channel can also have a say in becoming a part of the conversation by contributing your own writing, voice work, and editing, and whatever else as you like. So today, I've got a submission from Deadforge, the gentleman who asked the previous Q&A question, and he's going to lay out his theory about the major players in the Remedy Connected universe like Ati, Thomas Zane, and the board. So, take it away. Alan Wake is such a compelling game that combines elements from stuff like Twin Peaks and the Twilight Zone, and these elements make it ripe for theories and speculation. Which brings us here today from my theory. Alan Wake and Control both share many elements, but I want to focus on Ati, the janitor in Control, and the old gods of Asgard, and I believe their names and the name of their band are more than just references to Norse mythology. I think that they actually are Norse mythology. Ati is the name of a Finnish god of the sea, and Tor, or Thor, and Odin are of course Norse gods. Ati tells you the cassette you give him was a gift from friends aka the old gods of Asgard, hinting that they know each other. I think all three are in fact gods, and beings who serve a higher power, potentially the board, or whatever the board serves. Maybe they serve something else entirely, but I don't believe they are in these locations by chance. 
I think they are always placed there to help either Jesse or Alan along their journey and give them a bit of guidance towards a destiny that aligns with the views of whomever or whatever pulls the strings. I do believe that Ati's eternal fight with the mold is an attempt to stop the corruption of the oldest house, and the others are protectors as well against the darkness, or any kind of darkness for that matter. There's so many cosmic-like beings in play here, all trying to have these protagonists who wield a very unique power towards a certain objective, and we always get caught in the middle. You get caught in this battle between deities fighting for control of space and time. The gods of myth are used as pawns in this battle in the same way you are, but the real question is, why? And maybe Alan Wake 2 will give us that answer. Ati and the old gods of Asgard are basically like these protectors and these guiding lights. And I think that also connects to Thomas Zane. I don't know. I don't think that he wrote Alan Wake. I feel like he is more like your typical kind of Christian god. Thomas Zane is another being like Odin and Tor, another being like Ati, one of Finnish origin, one of Norse origin, and maybe one a little bit closer to the god that most Christians believe in. And I think Thomas Zane was another person along this journey to point Alan in the right direction. But Alan has the same power that Thomas once had, so maybe Thomas was no different than Alan. Maybe Alan is just a stand-in for Thomas. I don't know. I think in that same way, Alan got trapped within the darkness, and I think his only way to get out was to create Jesse and the Hiss. But for him to do that, I think that the Hiss kind of needed to already exist, in the same sense that the darkness already existed. They existed on some plane as something else, something otherworldly, that was let out due to these people. The Hiss and Jesse were created for that to happen. I think partially Control is a story created by Alan, but the oldest house itself is not. How Alan would know it existed, I don't know. But the oldest house itself predates all of it. Predates Thomas, predates Alan, predates Jesse, it predates everything. The oldest house is a being of its own, and how it all connects there is, is quite Alan, Thomas, Jesse, Ati, Odin, Tor. All of them are pawns in a bigger, bigger game. A game that we don't quite know how it's going to end yet, or how it all makes any sense. But someone, or something, is pulling strings. And it has been for a very, very long time. All right. Well, thanks so much, Deadforge. I appreciate you contributing to this very special return video to the channel after much time away. I honestly can't believe how fast I got this out compared to how long most things take me. But I guess love of the game got me here. So Remedy has to take a lot of the credit for inspiring this level of devotion. Now, I hate to bring the mood down just a little bit, but as you know, if you've watched any of my videos, I'm kind of a speaker for the dead. I always feel like giving people a send-off. So there's a really big and important aspect of Alan Wake's legacy that I think needs to be addressed really quick before I leave you today. And that is that many of the actors who made them great are no longer with us. Hartman's voice actor Mark Bloom, Odin Anderson's Cliff Carpenter, Cynthia Weaver's Linda Cook, and Alice Wake's Brett Madden have all since passed since the game released in 2010. I want to dedicate this video to their work and thank them for their help in making my life all the more enjoyable in Alan Wake, which is one of my favorite experiences and still to this day, one of the most memorable things I've ever played. A glass to you, sirs and ma'ams, for reminding us all to stay and the light. Thanks for watching. Seriously, you have no idea how encouraging that is.